Wszystkiego najlepszego z okazji 50. rocznicy Badminton Europe. Wszystko najlepsze jak jubileum Europska Badmintonowa Konfederacja. Happy birthday all uh, delegates and uh, member associations. På vegne av Norges Badmintonforbund, en av de elve forbundene som etablerte Badminton Europe, vil jeg få gratulere med 50-års jubileet og ønske lykke til i fremtiden. Jeg souhaiter en joyeux anniversaire à Badminton Europe pour ses 50 ans. Avrupa Badminton Federasyonu'nun 50. yılını tebrik ediyorum. Bütün üye ülkelere buradan selam ve saygılarımı sunuyorum. Daha nice 50. yıllara Badminton Avrupa Federasyonu'na üye olan ülkelerle birlikte kavuşmayı arzu ediyoruz. Stort tillykke med de 50 år Badminton Europe. Happy birthday Badminton Europe. Hello everybody, please uh, be seated so we will start in just a few minutes, please find a seat. Hi, good morning, everyone. So can I ask you to slowly move to your seats? Or quickly, if you want to. But, uh... <coughs> I'm not too high. I just want to be able to look over it, right, so I don't look in. No, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us all in, uh, in Prague. Uh, I'm very happy to see as many of our, our members uh, participating in, uh, in this three-day Congress, uh, which, as you know, is going to start with our, our forum. And if you look at our, the history of our forum, uh, it stems back from at least the young history of our forum, stems back from our development and administration seminar, which I know that many of you uh, visited in the past. And it was a, a bi-yearly event where we thought, uh, let's do uh, something two times. Uh, every two years, informing our members about what's going on in our organization. So there's more transparency, but also some uh, knowledge sharing amongst members, uh, and where we could then basically give a little bit more uh, light on some of our activities, but also you, as member associations, had a chance to interact uh, with people, uh, to learn from each other's experiences, and, and try to grow the sport in Europe. And, and that's very much what we feel our duty is uh, in Badminton Europe, is bringing you together, informing you uh, about what is going on, but also getting information from you, and hopefully that uh, all in, in a spirit where people are talking to each other, learning from each other, having fun together, um, and come together a little bit more to talk about interesting topics. So we've moved from doing a development and administration seminar uh, every two years. We moved to a forum 
at the Badminton Europe level, uh, a forum at the BWF level, uh, where our people are coming together more often, sharing experiences, uh, sharing uh, some downtime together as well, uh, in order to network and learn from each other. And that's very much what we would like to realize also here this morning. There's going to be quite a lot of speeches, obviously, over the next couple of days, and that has all to do uh, with the fact that Badminton Europe is celebrating its 50th year anniversary. Um, so you've seen already a couple of movies. Hopefully, many of you have seen the movies already on uh, YouTube before coming here, um, preparing us to, uh, to a great celebration here in Prague. There will be many festivities. There will be um, our uh, gala tomorrow evening, uh, obviously our ADM tomorrow, uh, where we do a, a little celebration as well for the 50th anniversary. So I hope that uh, on top of the networking, uh, on top of the experience that you share together here, uh, there will also be a little more celebration than usual uh, because this is a milestone for our federation uh, and I very much would like to thank uh, a lot of uh, the people here that have been part of this organization for so many years or have just joined the organization or a little bit more the active part of the organization at least um, after having been uh, elected in, into new roles uh, very recently. So a lot of new faces, a lot of more uh, I wouldn't say old faces, but at least faces that we recognize from before. Um, so I hope that uh, all of the new people will be well received and guided by the more experienced people, that you enjoy this forum, that you do network, and that you do make it interactive. Uh, and I think the people that have built the forum this year, uh, they really have thought hard about how we can get uh, you to speak more during uh, the forum, share experiences, because we know that within your member associations a lot of things are happening that are useful for other people to hear. There are issues that are useful to get other people's opinions on, uh, and there are definitely also ideas that you would have on how we can do things better. So don't take it as uh, a way of us explaining you what we are doing, but hopefully we can take these a couple of days together also as a moment where you basically feed into the organization that we are now for already 50 years and help shape that organization with uh, new ideas and new networking. You'll also see that uh, we, we've done it a little bit different um, with respect to the networking moment after this meeting, so you'll uh, see some surprises in the program around that. So the message that I'd like to bring is use this day specifically uh, as an informal setting to talk to each other, talk to us, ask questions, don't hesitate, we're all amongst friends over here. Um, we will try to get the same uh, out of you today and then we will have some uh, celebrations uh, over the next uh, couple of days. So can I ask uh, Brian to talk us through uh, some more of the, the practicalities around this? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to see so many familiar faces here. Um, I'll take you a little bit through the program, first of all, before I, I start with my first presentation. Um, Gregory mentioned most of it, but I'll just, uh, I'll be your moderator, first of all, today. I'll take you through the, the, the different presentations uh, during the day. Um, I will be starting myself talking about uh, the member association analysis that was done at the end of last year. Then uh, Emma Mason will talk about the, the BASIS program, which is a new initiative that was sent out just recently. Then there'll be a session on Par Badminton. We will um, be having a session on, uh, on our championships, on our events, uh, especially around our European club championships and the future of that event. Um, then we'll be uh, talking about technical uh, officials education. And, uh, and summer school will be on the uh, topic as well today. Uh, there'll be a, an item on, on women in badminton. Um, an interesting uh, topic today will also be the new European Training Center, where there'll be uh, two guys coming from Holbeck, that is the, the chosen host for the center, to present the facilities there. And we'll finish off 
up the, the, the program with uh, talking about social media. Uh, we have uh, Mark Feeland here as well, who's doing a lot of our, our social media and uh, journalistic stuff. So he will be making a presentation together with Emma from the office. Uh, and then Gurvi mentioned about the networking session that will happen in the end and, uh, and a question and answer ring session with the staff mainly. But let's get started. So the member association analysis was done at the end of, uh, of 2016 and um, we actually speeded up the process a little bit in Europe um, because we wanted to have all your input before we made the strategic plan for, for, uh, for 2017 and uh, I would like to thank all of you for completing the form in a timely manner. Um, I was actually very impressed. We had, we had uh, answers in from, from 51 out of 52 member associations. So I think that was really impressive. Um, so thank you. And we have just this week sent you the, the results, your individual results, um, so that you can see uh, that for yourself where you potentially can improve. But today I'm, I'm going to take you through the, um, the, the survey, what we are looking at, and also some of the activities that we are putting in place to, uh, to try to assist you to uh, to grow in some of the areas that, that are, are key in this analysis here. First of all, this is, um, the analysis lies with us under the Member Structures Commission, and um, that is chaired by, by Emma Mason. Um, and here, this is the terms of reference, and um, there, are, there are two or three words that, I'm, uh, that I highlighted. So that's first of all, that we are looking at the, at the framework, um, on, on how to develop you as member associations. And, and finally, well, you can say that's, that's, uh, that's the analysis and the basis of the analysis uh, and the results that we have there. And out of those results, we are then looking at uh, tailor-made activities to support you in, 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 the, in the areas. And the areas that we are talking about uh, are administration, it's communication, it's participation, it's events, and finally, it's high performance. And you can say those are the, the pillars that we believe are, are key to any, to any federation. Those are the areas that we are looking at in the analysis, and those are the areas where we are having activities. And if you look at the administration, the key areas here is that, uh, that there's a strategic plan in place. We're looking at how long that strategic plan uh, is, is laid out for. Um, then we are looking at uh, the registration of members. How is that being done? Is that being done manually, electronically? Do we have a system in place for that? We are looking at uh, what kind of finances are available to you as a federation. We are looking at Pop Anton integration and we are, we are looking at you know, the, the, the staffing situation. How many staff have you employed? So those are the areas that are being looked upon, that are being measured and uh, I'm just going to give you kind of an overall result of all members, um, and there you can see that, um, that we have, in that area of administration, we have 10 member associations that we have uh, classified as being advanced, 16 established, 12 developed, and, and 14 developing. Um, so it's, it's, actually, it's actually very much spread out, which is not that surprising, I guess. So what are we doing in the area of administration? We, are, we have just initiated the, the basis program. That'll, that's the next, next topic of, uh, of today's agenda, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. And there'll be an administrator's course also as part of that presentation. But those are basically the two areas within the administration area that, where we have activities that's going to support you in, uh, in your administration. The next pillar was uh, communication, and in communication, you are, you are we basically, we basically look at the, the social media that, uh, that you have as a federation and the uh, statistics around that, basically how many, how many followers do you have on Facebook, um, to which extent have you created a, a website, uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and so on. And communication is probably the, 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 the most uh, problematic um, you can say in terms of, uh, of, of, of how the, the answers came in on the analysis. You can see that actually 
35 out of 52 member stations are categorized as, as developing, which is kind of the lowest category. So um, what, we, what, we, what we quickly could see from the analysis is that the communication area is, is an area where we, where we need to, to do more collectively as a, as a confederation and, and US member associations. And here we are coming again back to the basis program. There are, there are elements in the basis program that can, that can help you with your communication. Then we're looking at, at sharing knowledge as much as we can. Um, we of course have a, a lot of uh, communication channels available to you that you're more than welcome to, uh, to share. And today the, the session we have in the end is also a chance for you to share among each other but also uh, with us. And, and finally, um, what we're doing here is a, is a media conference. We're doing one again during the European Championships where we have invited your uh, communication people to come to Culling and, uh, and meet, network, and to, uh, of course, report from the, from the championships. Next is participation. And uh, analysis here looks at, uh, at, at the number of par badminton players, registered players. It looks at, uh, at badminton in schools. It looks at how many clubs have you registered. And it looks at, uh, at availability of, uh, of courts and equipment in your country. How easy it is, is it to buy equipment, for instance, which can be a challenge in some places. And again here, the numbers speak for themselves. Six advanced, eight established, 21 developed, and, uh, and uh, 17 developing. So actually, you can see also here that, uh, that actually we are more heavy to, towards the bottom. Um, and so we have most of federations here scoring in the, in the develop and developing area. And the, the activities that we have within the participation is the shuttle time. It's a BWF project that we are running in, in Europe for quite a number of years, uh, successfully implemented in around 30 member associations. We have uh, coach education, also again a BWF coach education that we are implementing. And we have um, <coughs> equipment uh, as part of the, 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 the school program. We have school sets available for purchase as well, which is subsidized by us. Then we have um, events. And events, what we're looking at in analysis is uh, the club structure. Um, technical officials, nationally and internationally, and, uh, and which tournaments we're organizing for the different age groups, um, under 13, under 15, and, and, and elite as well. And the result here, nine advanced, five established, 24 developed, and 14 developing. The activities that we have here in this area, again, the basis program, there are some initiatives here that, that can support you within the events area. We have created an events manual, which is available on our website. Okay, we are back on. Thank you very much. That was very efficient. So we have a, we also have an administrator's course uh, for events under the World Academy of Sport that we'll come back to later. Now, if you look at, at high performance, we are looking at a high performance plan, if that's available, and for how, how many years. We're looking at coaches. That is what Kenneth Jonasson is, uh, is there for. We are looking at, at, at medals. Results, basically, we are looking at, uh, at coaching. What, uh, what kind of, uh, how, how, how often are your best players coaching? For instance, do you have, uh, do you have uh, weekly or do you have, do you have daily training with your best players? And we're looking at, at your positions in your, of your players in the BWF ranking. Results again, four advanced, six established, 23 developed, 19 developing. And the initiatives that we are doing here is our new training center that we'll come back to later in the presentation here today as well. There's Olympic solidarity that we are, that we are trying to assist you with, applying for. 
And uh, there's also, as part of the World Academy of Sport programs, there's one called Player Pathway, which basically helps you to develop a, a high performance plan. So that's, that's a, that course will be made, will be established again later this year. So that's another chance to, to, um, to attend that if, you're, if you do not have a high performance plan in your, in your federation. So that basically takes, takes uh, you through my presentation. I'd like just to finish off uh, before I open for, for a few questions uh, to say that, that generally you will see that we actually, um, we have a lot of developing, uh, well, lower, uh, we have a lot of challenges, let's say, in our federations in terms of still developing in, in actually all of the areas. And it, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit of a paradox because every time we, uh, we meet with BWF and we meet with other confederations. They always look at uh, on us as a very high developed confederation. But if you actually look at our individual member associations, uh, we can see that, that all of you are very different, but a lot of you also have, have, have challenges and the federations are, are often uh, run by, by just a very few people, not necessarily that many players. And then to do all the other things that we are, that we are measuring on here is, 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 is already a challenge. Um, so, so badminton generally, I would say, in Europe is, is very advanced in some federations, but, uh, but not very advanced in many other federations. And we are, we are here to try to help you uh, to build structures uh, as much as we can, all of you, basically. We are trying to have something that we can offer to, to all, on all levels, if, if you are advanced or if you are developing. But uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us, and we should not lean back and say everything is great. We can do much better, um, so let's try to do better together. Any questions? That's good, because actually we prefer to take questions in the end. So um, I will instead uh, give the floor to uh, Emma Mason, the chair of our Member Structures Commission. She will take you through the the BASIS program, which is a new support program that she will give you more information about now. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Thank you for being here. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Emma Mason. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm now the chair of the Member Structures Commission. So I'm here today to take you through um, the BASIS program. It's a new initiative that we've launched earlier this year. And I understand, well, I know that you've all been sent quite a detailed breakdown of the various levels of support that make up the BASIS program. The point of today's presentation is for me to introduce it more formally, but also to give you an idea about the background and the objectives behind the program. I'll then take you through the various levels of the program, and I'm very happy to take questions at the end of the presentation now, or you'll hear this a lot today, be very happy for you to talk amongst yourselves during the networking session, ask me questions then, ask Brian questions, and then come back at the end when we've got the opportunity for the roundup question and answers. So the BASIS program, it's based on an acronym, which is the Badminton Administrative Support and Network Sharing Program. Now, there's five key objectives or pillars in which we have brought this together. And I just want to run you through these to so sort of explain the background from where this program came. So the first is that it very quite obviously has an administrative and information sharing focus. The reason we've done that is that we believe that if we improve the administration within our member associations, we will be able to increase our efficiency, which frees up money and time for people within our member associations to spend on other things, whether that's event development, player development, or otherwise. The second is, and again, you may get sick of the phrase knowledge sharing today, but we believe that we have a great amount of knowledge and expertise within our member associations and within Badminton Europe itself. And we believe that we, by sharing that information, we can solve common issues that come up within our sport and within our member associations better and quicker. 
The second pillar or objective of the program is a recognition that not all of our member associations are the same. So we've just heard from Brian and we've seen an analysis and I know you've all been sent your individual analysis and also the overall European anonymized analysis so you can see where your member association sits. And I think from looking at, at Brian's presentation, we can clearly see that not all of our member associations are the same. So one support program that might help uh, the developing or the developed member associations might not necessarily help our advanced ones. So that let's lead us on to the third objective of the program, which is that it is going to be demand-led. We want to put on the programs that you want to receive. We want to provide you with support packages and help where you need them most. For this year, because it's the initial year and we wanted to run it out quickly, we've done, we've produced a package of programs that we'll run through now on the basis of the BWF membership survey. So we've looked at areas that we think are common, not weak areas, but common areas in which we can improve, and we've put together the package of programs that were sent out to you previously. The fourth pillar or objective that this is based on is the idea that it has an athlete focus. So there's a number of these programs which could be used in order to get retiring or retired athletes back in and keep them involved in our sport. We all know that when our athletes retire, they take with them a huge amount of knowledge about the sport, how it works, both from a sporting and from an administrative basis. And we want to make sure or try and help you retain that knowledge and that talent within your member associations. And the final objective in which the BASIS program is made up is, again, the idea that this is a three-way knowledge sharing platform. We want to provide you with support and help where we can, but we also want to hear from you about where it's best that we can help, what it is that you're having issues with, and we also want to facilitate a knowledge share between you as the member associations. I know there is an irony in a Brit standing up here and saying that Europe is stronger, better together, but um, we do believe that, and we do think that if we can facilitate that knowledge sharing, we can genuinely gain competitive advantages for Bampton in Europe. So I'm gonna take you through the different levels of the program. And as I say, if anybody has any questions, either while I'm going through at the end, please feel free to stop, stop me. So these are the titles of the five support levels that we've got this year. So there's going to be an internship program, a shadow program, representative visits, the World Academy of Sport Administrators course, which I'm gonna ask Brian to talk you through later on, and then finally the networking and information sharing sessions, the first of which is going to be held at the, later on in the program today. So take you through the first one, which is the internship program. So the idea behind this is that it will be an employee or a retired or recently retired athlete within your member association who will come to the BEC office for a period of between one and four months, which will be decided between Bampton Europe and the member associations. The idea behind that is when the intern is working within the Bampton Europe office, they will gain administrative experience of a variety of different tasks they will work with a number of different people, from Brian, the Secretary General, um, down to the volunteers at the events that they may go to. The idea is that they will gain experience of how best practice in administration and sports, both within the Continental Confederation and also when they go out to events with our um, Bampton Europe staff. We will provide support, both financial and obviously educational while we're there. Um, the full details of this is set out in the handout that was sent out to you, and I, I don't propose to run through these now. This is more to give you an overview uh, of the, the various options that we have in BASIS. So I think I can move on to... Uh, this is the fun slide about interns. Um, so the next program level of BASIS that we have is the shadow program. It works on a similar idea to the internship program, but on a much shorter basis. So the idea is that we will have one person, either an employee, a retired or retiring athlete from your member association, come 
with Badminton Europe to one of the major Badminton Europe activities. So it'll either be summer school, our European Championships, or one of the coach education shuttle time courses. The idea behind this and the objective that we want to achieve is that that, in, um, that shadow person will be able to gain knowledge about how Badminton Europe runs its major events, what's required, what the steps are in order to run a successful, uh, successful project like summer school or the European Championships. We believe that that knowledge that we can help give the person on the shadow program is equally transferable back into your member associations when you're running your major events. Again, Bampton Europe is going to be providing financial and other support, so we will pay the flight ticket for whoever is on the shadow program, and we will provide food and accommodation for the individual during it. As I said, with the internship program, I'm not going to go through the full details. There's much more details in the handout that was sent to you uh, previously, but feel free to ask me questions either afterwards or during the networking session this afternoon. So the third level of support and basis program is what we've called the representative visits. This is almost, we talked about it as a res reverse uh, shadow program. Essentially, we recognize that not every member association is able to give up uh, one of their employees for a period of one to four months or even for a weekend. We know that not all member associations have that ability. But you would still like to be able to knowledge share, to learn best practices, and to learn how to develop your member association from an administrative point of view. So the representative visit will be where someone from the Bampton Europe office will come to your member association for a period of two to four days. And again, this is flexible. We want to offer something that suits you and that suits your needs. They will come and beforehand you will agree the topics that you're going to knowledge share on where perhaps you feel like you need support or you have queries or questions about how you can best carry out a task or an activity and you over the course of those two to four days will have a variety of meetings with the person from Bampton Europe and hopefully at the end you will come away having learned a great deal about ways in which you can perhaps improve, and we will have learned a lot more about how we can help support your member association. Again, Bampton Europe will be paying for the flight, the accommodation, and food for the representatives, so you won't need to fund anything in advance. And again, I think this was in the full handout that went out to you, but Bampton Europe is very happy to you know, meet with people who are involved in the funding of your sport while there so they can better understand the sporting context in which your member association operates. That comes back to the recognition point. Not every member association works within the same funding or support structure within their country. We recognize that, but we don't have a full understanding of it. So hopefully the representative visits will allow us to do that. I think now I'm going to ask Brian to come up on the stage and talk to you about the fourth level of support, which is the World Academy of Sports Administrators courses. Thank you, Emma. So the World Academy of, of uh, Sport is an institution that the uh, Badminton World Federation started to, to work with um, a few years ago. We can say as a, as a sport, we have uh, you know, a history of educating technical officials. We have a history of, of educating uh, coaches, but we do not really have an, a history of educating administrators or um, in this case also um, uh, in fact, um, events organizers. So with the World Academy of Sport, there are some uh, programs being offered now where we, uh, where we can start to educate, uh, in this case, administrators as well. <coughs> so last year, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a course held in, uh, in Malaysia by BWF where some of our staff went. To, uh, to learn how to deliver these, uh, these courses. 
So uh, there was a bit of homework to be done after that in terms of actually uh, tailor, uh, making the courses tailor-made to, to the audience, which will be, will be you basically. So it's, it's not a, it's not a, a ready fit. It's a, there's a lot of topics and then we have to kind of put the program together uh, ourselves. But we, um, we got a lot of um, information and a lot of tools on, on how to make the, the, the course ourselves. So basically what the administrator's course is, is doing is taking you, uh, is giving you information around strategic planning, around budgeting, uh, basically all the elements of, of running a federation uh, office. Um, and we can, you know, we can, we can go in depth or we can, we can, uh, we can uh, spend less time on areas that's up to ourselves. Uh, what it requires to come on the physical course is that you first, uh, that, the, that the candidates first fill in an online, uh, an online course to kind of give us an, an indication of where, where are you, what is the background, what kind of, what kind of level uh, of information do, do you come with. And, and, and based on, on, on those online courses, we are then going to, to finalize the actual course. And uh, we've actually already set a date for the course this year. So from 24 to 26 of November, you can put that in your diary. There's going to be a World Academy of Sport course, and it's actually going to be held here in Prague. Again, we're coming back. We, it'll be run in connection with our uh, European Under-17 Championships here in Prague. There's no connection between the two, but they are being held at the same time. So 24 to 26 of November. And... Um, as I said previously, this is, uh, this is something that's driven by, by BWF mainly. And for us, the positive thing is that also BWF is, uh, is supporting this financially. <coughs> so I think we, we, and that's actually rather fresh information. So we put up here that we are going to pay 300 euros towards travel and food and accommodation. I think we are going to pay the full travel expenses, uh, even if it's more than 300 euros. Um, so it, it's, it's a fully funded uh, activity. So um, please make sure that you, that you send people that needs to, uh, to uh, or that, that could benefit from being educated by the administration. We are going to run an administrator's course and an events course at the same time. There'll be some areas that, you know, that are the same in the two courses, so we can run that as one session, and then we'll run it as breakout sessions. So those that follow the administrator's course will go to to, uh, with, with some educators and, and others will go for the, for the events. A new, a new initiative, I think it's an important one. I think it's an interesting one. Um, so I hope you will support it. We hope this will be a, a very expensive exercise for BWF, that you will send a lot of people. Um, it's fully funded. So please, please turn up. Any questions? If that's not the case, I'll give the floor back to Emma. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. So I will take you through now the final level of support in this year's BASIS program, which we have called network and information sharing between the MAs. So the idea behind this is similar to the overall objective of BASIS, which is we know we have a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge within our member associations, a variety of different levels, but we don't actually all get together in a room very often, perhaps once, once a year here at the ADM or a couple of times a year at the major events, so, and not even always then. So we want to give the member associations opportunities to meet together and talk because we recognize that common issues come up throughout all of our sports, whether it's sports presentation at our major events, whether it's how to resource within our um, member associations, whether it's how, how do we have online applications for tournaments. You know, all these things come up time and time again within the member associations. And the idea with these sessions is that you will be able to meet together it doesn't necessarily need to be all of you. You know, if you feel like, having looked at the analysis, that there's other member associations within your group who maybe have the same problems, and you want to get together and talk about the best ways that you think you could deal with it, or perhaps a way in which you found that you've dealt with it, then that's what these sessions are aimed at doing. 
we, as Bampton Europe, will provide you with a meeting room um, and all the equipment that you would need, and we'll obviously provide you with refreshments while there, and we will help facilitate the meeting if you want, in terms of taking you through what you want to talk about. But the idea is generally that this will be demand-led. So if you want to hold a session where you talk to other member associations about sports presentation, as I say, then we will help you put one of these sessions on, whether it's at a major event, whether it's a tournament that's being hosted in your country. Anything, really we're open to hear your ideas about how this best can work for you. Um, as I said, we will pay all the on-site costs in terms of meeting room hire, IT equipment and refreshments, and one of us will be there in order to help facilitate the session. Uh, I think, I hope that you will see the value in this, that we can share our information better, and we can get better and quicker solutions by doing this. I think... As I said earlier, the first one of these sessions will be later on this afternoon during the forum. And I'd really encourage you to reach out, not just to me, to Brian, and to the other members of the Member Structures Commission to ask about the BASIS program, but also to talk to one another and to uh, communicate about what's going on within your member associations, whether there's common areas that you can help each other deal with, or whether there's things that you would like us to incorporate into the BASIS program next year. I think that's the end of mine. I'd just like to close by saying to thank Badminton Europe and also my member structure commission colleagues for helping us put this together. I believe in the program and its intentions and what we're trying to do here in order to improve administration within our member associations. Having said that, this is supposed to be a demand-led program. So if you feel like there's things we could do better or that you want to see on the, on the basis program from next year, we're going to review it on an annual basis. I would encourage you to speak to me today, speak to me across the weekend, or send an email to the office and let us know your thoughts. And finally, I would very much encourage you to apply and to get involved. We are able to support you with these programs and we want to help you, so please do get in touch. That's it. Thank you. I'll give the floor back to Brian. Unless anybody has any questions. Sorry, I should have said that. Does anyone have any questions for now? <laughs> I'm not sure I want to say this for money. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. We're, we're 52 countries. Uh, it, it's all a bit of an effort for all of us to make... The, the geographic move to a single place. And I, I think all of these ideas are fantastic. Knowledge management, knowledge sharing is a brilliant concept. But what I've seen so far is from the analog world rather than the online world. <clears throat> and I'm wondering, a simple idea might be to have a webinar system whereby there's some kind of portal that member associations can sign into. Uh, I'm not, I don't have any view as to what the uh, topic should be, but that would be an easy way which would avoid the travel necessity. Thanks, Ronnie. I mean, from my perspective, I love taking things into the 21st century, and I, I certainly think you're going to talk later about communication and how we can better improve that. So I really, first of all, I appreciate the feedback, and second of all, I think it's a really important thing to take on board, and we'll certainly take that away and look and see what we can do with it. Um, if anybody else has any other comments on that, please feel free to come up to me um, at the networking session, because again, if that's what you're saying we want, then that's what we'll work towards. Does anyone else have any other questions? So, sorry, a, a bit to Ronnie's point, also answering uh, uh, your question, because I, I think a lot of what we're looking for also within BWF, we're trying to put it more into a kind of a webinar context, and you'll see also that I'm part of the administrator course, but also part of some of the other courses that are coming up. We're at least going to start with a basis that is web-based rather than 
having to meet because it's, it's a very fair point uh, that we won't want people all traveling all over the place to get knowledge. There are other means of communications these days. So I, I think you will see a development towards that and, and also especially with the World Academy of Sport initiatives. But some of the other development initiatives at BWF, we're really starting to explore that. And we'll see how it works because it's, it's a bit of a, a question to us how our members will respond to it but at least we will put up availabilities for, for us to be able to check uh, whether that is something that, that could work. So I think it's a very uh, fair point that we shouldn't be traveling if we don't have to. Of course, it's always nice to meet each other once in a while because that also strengthens uh, the, the networking. So I think a fair balance probably is what we should be looking for, but I, I think it's a very fair point. Yeah, I think just to pick up on what Gregory said, again, I very much like the idea of a webinar and offering a level of support along those lines. I think some of the initial programs, the shadow and the internship program, they, they work on the basis that you really, that's work experience almost, and really we, we all know that in order to get that type of experience, it really has to be hands-on, but I certainly think that's something we should pick up going forwards. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments for just now? Okay. Thank you very much. I will hand back to Brian. And I hope to see you all later in the networking session. <laughs>
urge you just to take a look at it and try to set up uh, an application that we are very much looking forward to get from you. And then we'll try to really uh, organize it with you and have a fruitful event for everybody. So this is in your mailbox. Please have a look and come back to us with an application that is the main object. This is a deadline for the 2nd of May, so please, uh, any considerations, any doubts that you have, please contact Tanya in the office and uh, on these aspects, on practicalities, if it is not totally uh, clear in the application to us, but I think is everything is there that you need to know on what you need to have to, to really host this uh, event. And this is the, the situation that you have also uh, that is new for the training camp for the, the elite players from Para Badminton. This is new now because then we'll have, as soon as we decide on the host, we'll have uh, 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 advertised the, really the inscription for all the players uh, that open for application in May. So that uh, we'll be getting then the, the names of the, your para athletes who want to participate in this training camp and that we we'll, can really do the, the, the selection for who will be taking part of this. That will be a deadline for that in July, so please look into that. See, they put them in their calendar, uh, your para-athletes, and see if they are willing to participate in this training camp. So this is the main idea. This is uh, in cooperation with the BWF, because then we'll be having, for sure, also some para-badminton players from uh, other parts of the world. So this is important for the sparring, for the, the knowledge that we can get all the best from this uh, training camp just before the World, world Championships. Uh, as you say, it's uh, until May. And now I will very shortly uh, pass the floor to Maria. We'll take us through uh, their experience of really working with para-badminton in Moldova. Maria. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria, and uh, I will be talking about uh, para badminton in uh, Moldova. Uh, the first encounter of Moldavian Badminton Federation with para badminton took place uh, last year at the BEC <coughs> Members Forum. Um, our delegates participated at the Ja, ja Matos para badminton session, as well as the practical badminton sessions, a session and tried out the wheelchairs. Um, it was a difficult and uh, th at the same time a challenging ex experience. Su subsequently, a collaboration between Moldavian Badminton Federation and Inva Sport Association um, was established. Uh, which resulted in a co-organization of an event in December 2016. Um, it was a training session with a, a few InvaSport athletes. Um, it was the first time such an event was held. Uh, the athletes were really excited and cooperative. Uh, they showed great interest uh, and strived to learn under the coach's guidance. Uh, this experience was new both for the athletes and for the coaches, as, uh, and uh, it was very defying for them as they never tried this before. Um, the coaches' expectations were exceeded, and the game marked itself as uh, a stimulating and mostly inspiring activity. It was, it was also a great pleasure to work with uh, people that were interested in finding out the peculiarities of the sport. Even though this, ex this event was successful, we cannot say it was perfect. There are still uh, a lot of aspects that should be taken in, uh, that should be worked on, uh, and a lot of room for improvement. The event actually emphasized and drew, drew our attention to some of the problems that the para-athletes in, um, encounter while uh, training and practicing, and the most important ones being the lack of specialized coaches, sport equi equipment, and the wheelchairs for training. 
Um, some of the difficulties and challenges concerning the para badminton in Moldova are related to the lack of information uh, regarding the sport. It is basically unknown, thus there is a need to promote it in social environments as a sport that improves inclusion and that can help persons with different abilities to realize their full potential and advocate for changes in society. Um, another obstacle is establishing a para badminton center where with um, experienced trainers, specialists, where we could um, train already engaged athletes and involve potential ones. Also, it is a challenge to organize local, comp uh, local competitions and to motivate uh, athletes to participate. Um, another problem would be participating at international competitions because um, the para-athletes require uh, financial support, not only for equ equipment, but also for traveling expenses. Some of the athletes um, need uh, special attendance during the trip, which means additional expenses, and this is uh, more, uh, one more reason why they uh, hesitate to participate at competitions. Um, in order to solve these problems, uh, we came up with uh, the following solutions. Um, we are cur currently working on a para badminton section on Moldavian Badminton Federation's website. Uh, we are aiming to raise awareness of this sport. Uh, one of m our most important goals is to prepare specialized coaches and to motivate them to participate at para badminton training courses abroad. Also, we want to find companies that would uh, be willing to provide sport equipment and wheelchairs for the athletes and to attract investments in order to establish a para badminton center. Uh, the need to grow para badminton should be put high on the agenda uh, in order to build uh, and develop this array of the sport in Moldova for, uh, to the degree it requires. Uh, by means of investments, coach education, search for development opportunities, research, for partnerships, and promotion. One of the remarkable abilities of the Paralympic sports is that they demonstrate the capacity and the firm commitment of, to provide an opportunity for people of all abilities to participate and be involved in sports and which we believe um, it is an inspirational thing that we would like to take part in. Thank you for your attention. If there's any questions. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Maria, and uh, I would like to really also to mention, uh, besides uh, Moldova, two other countries that make a great improvement in the last year, that was also the Faroe Islands and, uh, and uh, uh, Romania on para badminton uh, activities and really putting forward this uh, area of our sports. Um, that said, I would, uh, would like to really give you a little bit more information on uh, the situation of para badminton, mainly related to the BWF, and that is for the World Federation uh, situation. On this, I will put forward here that we have also in our website, the time frame that is uh, available for uh, how we should really develop and, the, deadline, and the, the main dates that we have until Tokyo 2020. So please take a look at it and uh, have an idea that that's how they will be getting the classification system and the, the, the parts of the, the para badminton that will be in Paralympics in 2020. All the deadlines are there. Just take a look and find out how it is uh, planned for the next months. Uh, on this uh, also, we have the information that they will be uh, providing from the BWF for the para athletes uh, some grants for international tournaments participation. Look it up, it will come out, as I believe, in April uh, on your mailbox for your para-athletes, especially for the female players. Uh, this is now for only SL3 and SL4, uh, but then it is uh, an important step to help and get them international participation for the athletes that is uh, so costly to participate all over the world. 
So this is just an information on the BWF side. And of course, also the, on the educational uh, part, they are doing the, a new para badminton coach model that is being finalized and will be sent, uh, put out very soon uh, on uh, the education specifically for para badminton athletes. So this is an important step that PWF is also having on full integration also on this part of the education uh, system of BWF. Um, this is uh, now I will put forward a little video that is not still uh, launched and uh, finalized on this, but just to let you uh, have a look at how it will show up in the future. Uh, so this is just to give you the final uh, update on this uh, on this situation, and uh, of course uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, as been said before, any questions on this small part of the of the presentation? Otherwise, I will take this opportunity to to tell you that on the BWF side too. It's on, on the way, Paul Kurtz, the Vice President for Para Badminton from the BWF, is on his way, but he, he will be sure to attend the networking session in the end of this forum. So please uh, approach me, Tanya from the office, uh, or Jimmy also, and mainly also Paul Kurtz, that will be joining us this afternoon with any questions and any help that we can give to you on, uh, on developing Para Badminton in your part uh, uh, of Europe. So um, that is uh, something that I would like to say thank you and hope to have your questions in the end of, the, of this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So we're a little bit ahead of time. That's okay. No, don't, uh, don't get nervous about that. Um, what we're actually doing uh, today is we are, we are streaming this forum. I don't know if that was uh, sufficiently said in the beginning, um, but we are streaming live. Actually, we have sent out information to, uh, to all of you, to the federations, uh, and that's us, to the, to the federations yesterday. So uh, now when we have the, a little bit longer coffee break, um, it would be great if you, could, uh, if you could help us to promote that we're actually online here, that we are streaming today, so that also uh, badminton enthusiasts back in your countries can, uh, can actually follow what we're talking about today. And um, it will also be uh, available on demand afterwards, so it will be on our YouTube channel afterwards, so you can also promote and, and, and link that on your websites uh, and via social media. Um, after, afterwards, the next week when you come back. But if you can already uh, today ask your staff or whoever is back in, uh, in your federation to, to do a bit of promotion around this, share, share the information, share the information that we have put out on, uh, on Facebook, on, uh, on Twitter, on Instagram, then uh, that would be great that you can see yourself. So that was, uh, that was one thing. can just enjoy yourself for, for a few seconds. Um, coffee is almost ready, but um, we, need to bridge, we need to bridge it a little bit, and uh, that's why I, I thought since we are coming in from all over Europe, and I know many of you know each other, but there are also some new faces. If, you, if uh, on the way out for the coffee break, which will be served just outside, if you could uh, introduce yourself to uh, three people that you haven't met before. Uh, that would be great. Then, uh, then we can open up the interaction a little bit. So on the way out, if you first of all say hello to three people, introduce yourself, where you're from, your name, and uh, once you have uh, accomplished that small task, coffee will be ready outside. When we, uh, when we come back, um, 
We will hear about uh, the future of the European club championships. That will be an interesting one to get your feedback on. I don't know how much we are taking immediately and how much we are taking at the end in the Q&A. We will hear about technical officials education, summer school, uh, and, uh, and women in badminton before we, before we break for lunch. But um, please stand up, say hello to three people, and then uh, when that's done, go and find your coffee outside. Thank you so far.
que Okay, I think we are ready to reconvene. If you can hear me outside, please start to find your seats again. Please slowly take your seats. We are ready to start. Okay, it's good to see everybody more or less uh, back in their seats. 
So before we continue with the more official part of the program, in the lead up to the Congress, we have uh, we made a few videos that you maybe some of you have seen on our social media. But it's basically some of our some of the people involved in the commissions in the board giving a, you know, a small explanation about uh, what their role is, what they're doing, what they're working with. So we are going to uh, play a few of those videos for you now. It's probably less boring than hearing us talk all the time, so there's a little bit up on the screen. So, uh, Sophia, are we ready to play the first one? Thank you. Some of the people involved in the commissions, in the board, giving a, you know, a small explanation about uh, what their role is, what they're doing, what they're working with. So we are going to uh, play a few of those videos for you now. It's probably less boring than hearing us talk off. Okay, commission meetings are held twice every year. They're an opportunity for the commission and board members to get together and discuss the objectives of the commission and measure them against uh, the KPIs that they set in the strategic plan and look to see how they can progress their development areas of badminton. So in the commission meetings, we spend a lot of time uh, discussing new ideas and trying to find what's best practice for, for each of our areas. Also, I'm chair of the High Performance Commission, so it's really re reviewing our strategy, um, spending a lot of time looking at the operations around that, and then really a lot of discussions around the individual key strategic areas. Um, so for example, uh, one of the key ones at the moment is the uh, European Training Center. So that's taken up a, a large piece of our time the past uh, six to nine months in the planning. Uh, the past couple of months we've been going through the process of tendering and meeting all of the, uh, the bids around that and that's still ongoing. So that's really been a, a big piece of the work. Um, along with that, uh, the scholarships that we give a lot of the top young players um, the training centers that we have had the past couple of years and uh, we're always reviewing and trying to improve things around that so um, all of that work keeps us uh, very busy. Step one it's more or less easy it's the nights it's the weekends it's the holidays uh, I have a full function job uh, uh, outside of badminton so it's really all giving all the extra time and all the, the weekends and nights to our sport so that is uh, something that I'm very proud of being able to do. I have a full-time job I'm not engaged or paid by uh, the badminton Denmark organization I have a full-time job besides uh, being on the board of directors in badminton Europe and in the commissions and uh, I use my uh, spare time in the evening and the weekends and I use some holidays uh, uh, to participate in badminton. And I don't mind about it because I love to be in badminton. I've been in, in vol voluntary in badminton since I was 15 and that's quite a year, some years ago. When you are fond of, uh, of badminton like me, uh, dedicate your time to, into my role is uh, it's, it's not a question of time and to part the time uh, at work or not at work. And, uh, because when I talk about badminton, when I think about badminton, it's still a pleasure for me. So I don't think that I'm working when I talk about badminton and I think about badminton. So maybe the link I can do is uh, in my professional job as uh, working in education. So I think when I think about education, I always think about what can education can be in badminton. So, this is my way of doing my role, I think it's uh, uh, me, every day, at every time, in any moment. One of my early projects, the summer school, is dear to my heart. Together with Martin Anderson, I started the summer school 
back in the early 1980s and it's still going on today in the same spirit and that is a great pleasure. It's uh, the project that the Badminton Europe is working on now at the moment and that's the Center of Excellence. I think this is a very unique project and it is extremely important for the future of the European players. Something like this is really needed in our continent and I really and strongly believe in the potential of this project and the development that will bring to the European players. Obviously the, the High Performance Center is a great one, but I think a lot of the, the development activities in my former life, I was also the Director of Development of uh, Badminton Europe, a lot of those projects are very near to me. Um, and especially also the, the Shuttle Time project that we're running in uh, conjunction with uh, the Badminton World Federation and, and that David Cabello uh, from Spain has led uh, within uh, BWF. So very uh, surprised actually in the end also that uh, Shuttle Time uh, knows the success it does know uh, today. I was always a big supporter of the project but I never uh, thought that it would uh, be as successful as it is today so definitely kudos to uh, David and the team of BWF um, and then obviously also our team of Badminton Europe uh, for, the, for the great implementation of that project. Four main projects uh, lately, of course, it is with the Commission, with the Para Badminton, that I uh, am happy to be involved. That is something that we really have to develop and go forward for. Looking forward to Tokyo uh, with the, the first appearance of Para Badminton, and that is mainly one of the things that I've been more focused. And of course, also I have some uh, running project that uh, I started a few years ago with the three working group, and uh, we've been really interested to not losing the the people with experiences, with all the, the knowledge that we have from many years in our, uh, in our co-federation. So that is something that I'm really, really uh, happy to be part of and uh, uh, that I'm fortunate to be the one founding. So I'm keeping all these uh, people around us who have served so well the organization in the past. Talking, talking about my main project is also talking about the, the commission I chair, so around Sports for All. There is so many topics in this commission because we are talking uh, about badminton from the beginning to all the life. So I think my main project will still uh, be connected to my best memory. So I think that the summer school is a very good project and uh, to renew it, it's always very difficult because very, a lot of people are very uh, kind to think about the summer school as it was for her or for them when they leave it. So I think summer school uh, can be my best project for the next few years uh, around education also. That was, uh, that was two videos that were produced um, in advance of this uh, Congress. We have a few more that we might show you later, if time permits. But uh, now we will continue the, the program. First of all, I will say it was good to see uh, a lot of interaction outside, a lot of talking. Um, luckily, time permitted for that, but uh, of course, there will be much more time later to, during the networking session, but uh, it seems that started already now in the first coffee break. So Please continue and uh, make sure that you also prepare some questions for us later uh, that might come out of the, today's program. The next, uh, the next presentation will be done by, the next presentations will be done by, by Jimmy. And the uh, first one will be around the future of the European Club Championships and uh, he will then continue to inform you about technical officials education. Thank you, Brian. Emma, can I borrow your high heels? Uh, our European Club Championships is an event going back to 1978, so closely approaching 40 years. Not to our very beginning, but it is one of our events that has been running for, for quite some years. Uh, unfortunately, it has shown the, the last couple of years that the amount of teams has been going this way. 
as you see, back in 2009, we had 20 teams going up to 21. Even if we, if we would have extended this back all, uh, all the way to 2006, you would have seen 24 teams when it was held in, uh, in Paris. So uh, unfortunately, it shows that there is a, there is a lack of interest, uh, a lack of participation in, in this event. It clearly shows that uh, it's the same member associations uh, supporting the event uh, year by year. And, and obviously, for that participation, we are, we are grateful. Without you, there would be no event. Uh, but the last many editions have been held in, in the same uh, country in Europe. Uh, be held, uh, that was held in France. So, of course, a big thanks to, to the French Babington Association for, for their support in hosting the event. Uh, this year, it will be held in, uh, in Milan. And next year, it will be held in Poland. Uh, but after this... We actually don't know what to do. We hear many explanations uh, about why people are not uh, taking part in the event. Of course, we all know we only have 52 weeks in, in the calendar. That is relatively difficult to change. It comes with expenses to travel to, to Europe Cup, to play for, for five days, wherever it is. It's uh, funded many times by local clubs. Some associations are supporting their clubs, but, but not all. It comes with the expenses for, for the players, and there are, there are no income. And if there is an income, then it's the income for, for the players paid by the clubs, meaning it's not, the, it's not funding coming from outside. The, the tournament, it doesn't give uh, world ranking points. Uh, that is not something we can influence. It's, it's a club tournament, so it's not possible for, for us to, to introduce world ranking points. Uh, it comes with less and less prestige to, to win the, the tournament, to participate in the tournament. We, obviously, we, we acknowledge that in some countries there is a prestige winning a, winning a title. It holds, the, it holds the title of a European Championship, so in some countries it does hold a prestige, but definitely not for all. <coughs> and then we, we see, in, especially in, in Asia, we see more professionalism in team events, meaning that uh, people... Uh, travel to earn some, some good money, especially in, in the Asian leagues. And I believe this is also something that we might see coming up soon in, in Europe. We saw uh, NBL in, in England uh, as a good example over three years. Unfortunately, uh, it was cancelled two days ago for going forward, which is also uh, extremely bad for, for club badminton in, in Europe. So I have uh, one slide for you I would like to show you. This one. What do we do? For us, it has been discussed in our major events commission. It is uh, one of our European championships. We are, we are keen to continue the event, but it, uh, it, it requires hosts, first of all, and it requires participation, because if we don't have any, any teams, we don't have any tournament. So should we continue? That's, that's the question that was discussed in the major events commission. It was also discussed in the board. And it was, it was quite clear that uh, there was no easy answers to, to this question. And therefore, it was, uh, it was also quite clear that this should be brought to, to you, uh, our member associations, because you're the one who are hosting. You're the ones that are sending the teams. And of course, if, the, if, you're, if you're not hosting, if you're not sending your teams, then you don't have any event. So... Uh, this slide is one I very much would like you to, to give some thoughts. I don't expect any, any answers right now. Uh, give it some thoughts, go back to your federations, discuss internally. Do we want to continue with the European Championships? Is this something we uh, support? Is it something that we, we don't want to take part in? I don't need, I don't need to, 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 to see the excuses again, because those we already know, and, and we fully acknowledge those, so we know where country to country stand. But if, if this is something that we need to continue, then we need your support. And if we don't have the support, then we might as well do something else, do something different. That can be a commercial activity, it can be a different kind of event. So we are, we are open for all kind of uh, ideas and inputs to you, uh, from you. Any questions so far? Any good ideas? I'm more than happy to, to hear them already now, but if not, feel, uh, feel free to discuss this uh, during the networking session or back in your, your MAs and, and come forward with, uh, 
with ideas and input. And now we're speaking events, it should not all be negative, so uh, why not make a, a small announcement? In uh, 2018, we have a, a big event in February, which is not yet allocated. It's the uh, men's and women's team championships held together with the European Under-15 championships. Uh, twice we have seen a great success of, of this event since the, the combination of it. Heard a lot of good uh, feedback, especially from, from the young players, being able to, to play alongside the, the big stars. We, we saw good examples in, in Basel in uh, 2014, where it was introduced, and also last year in, in Kazan in Russia, where they, it was held for the second time. So, any guesses? Okay, I'll show you. A small, uh, small few graphics from, from the city in which we will play next year. Yes. Why change something that is good? The National Badminton Federation of Russia has submitted a, a good bid, which is very similar to, to what we saw in 2016. We saw a great event. We saw a big participation, both in the team events and in the under-15. So we are, we are happy to announce that in, in 2018, we're going uh, back to Kazan in, in, in February to, to play the European men's and women's team championships, as well as the European under-15 championships. And of course, it's, it's counting as a Thomas Huber Cup qualification for the Thomas Huber Cup finals in Thailand in May 2018. Any comments? <clears throat> if not, then I will uh, continue with the next agenda point. Is that okay, Brian? Adrian? Yes. Yes, I can, but uh, I would prefer a mic so everybody else could hear as well. Um, I, I appreciate the, the kind of maybe some of the questions wanting to come at the end and you, you referencing uh, doing some networking later on. I, I'd be really keen to understand from the floor um, if there are any views, there may not be any views around the European Club Championships, what, what people think. I think we can go back to our associations and we, we never then get to hear what each other thinks. We kind of have an opportunity, I think, in a forum maybe to discuss some of these issues. If, if there's no comments, there's no comments, but um, I would be quite interested to see what, what um, our colleagues from other MAs th uh, feel. I, I completely agree. I would very much welcome. Uh, but what about the, can, can we get the views from England to just to start off a good discussion? You, of course, could have the views from England. Um, I mean, we, we currently don't participate um, in the European Club Championships. It's not that we don't necessarily want to, but the key issues for us have always been about if players are playing in the European Club Championships and some of the other national leagues prevent players from playing in them, which is what our players want to also to be able to do. I think my own view is the European Club Championships, as it is, doesn't work. Um, however, uh, that's not to mean by reformatting it, it could, it could work. You know, we would... We certainly see it maybe as England putting in a selected team, if you like. It wouldn't necessarily be a club, but we might call ourselves a club for the purposes of it. But use it almost as a development opportunity for some of our young players. You, you referenced the NBL finishing, and, and you know, this for us could be an, ex an opportunity for some of those young players to get to experience some international competition or a competition against some international players in a kind of team environment, which doesn't happen that often. So that, that's the view from England as you asked. Uh, just a small comment regarding the format. Uh, I agree always to look at, at different formats to, like, to make the, the competition more interesting. But what we did uh, two years ago was to go from, from a seven-match uh, seven format down to a five-match format, which actually means you need less players, you, uh, subsequently less expenses. If you want to bring a small team, uh, and, and the matches actually became more interesting in, in the two editions we've seen so far. But, but I, I completely agree. If, uh, if there are any ideas regarding the format, whatever it might be, please uh, come forward, and it's always, always worth a good consideration. Thanks, Adrian. Christians? Hello, uh, Christians from Latvia. Um, first of all, we, we decided to participate uh, event in this year, first time. And uh, why? Because we think it's not only a question about major events, because the club championship and club par paramida of 
club championship, I think is most important thing for developing of badminton. Because if we not uh, put a responsibility for players to clubs and uh, the pyramid of clubs, it's same like uh, team events for under other sports like football, basketball, etc. That we as federation will be responsible for all things for uh, players. And I think it's very, very important question because I think it's not question about we have money or incomes from this event or no. Because in Latvia we also have not very successful uh, championship for teams. But we are developing team uh, 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 philosophy because we understand that then municipalities or clubs will be responsible for uh, invite better players to pay for coaches, etc., etc. Otherwise, we as federation will be responsible for all things. And I, I'm very, very, uh, it's a good, not good perspective. Thanks, Christian. So, so just to, to summarize, it seems like saying you're participating for the first time, so you obviously see it as a, as a positive event to, to continue with. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Ivan, uh, Gibraltar as a small nation, perhaps if you do cons reconsider the format, um, consider how it might benefit smaller nations, something similar to, at a club level, uh, similar to Sudiman Cup, where it's divided into divisions. A club from Gibraltar doesn't want to play a club from England or Denmark because there's too much disparity in level, so maybe look at uh, different divisions within the club format. Just a proposal. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's definitely a, a, a valid comment. Uh, the graphic we just showed uh, showed 13 teams last year, and there was, there was a big variety on, on, on the level of play. Uh, obviously, we know the, the Russians are always coming with a, with a club team from Vladivostok, which is more or less equivalent to the national team, extremely strong. The two French teams that have been participating the last few years, extremely strong. But there is a very, very large gap, uh, we must say, to, to the, from those teams and, and down to the rest. Uh, whether it should be divided in divisions or whether it should be some kind of qualification play in the early stage of the week could be considered, I, I, I agree. But th those, are, th those are the ideas to formats we very much would, would appreciate co coming from you because we have been looking at, at the same event uh, for, for many years and, and sometimes it's definitely better to have fresh eyes on formats, so by all means, if you do have specific ideas on, on new formats, on whether it's divisions, whether it's a qualification play, whether it's a selected teams from, from some associations, by all means, bring it forward, and it's, it's definitely worth a consideration. Belgium. Hi, Sven, uh, Belgium. Um, just one thought we had in uh, in Belgium. It was uh, the date where it's played because our Belgian national competition, it's for young Belgian potential uh, players, and uh, right in the, the date it's organized. Uh, most of the time they are in exams at school, and so they can't participate. And then we have to see whether it's number two, number three, or number four in the Belgian competition to uh, compete. And the team that is Belgian champion wants to go there as a team and not with uh, the second or third uh, players of the team. And so the date for us is, is quite a, a problem. If it's in the neighborhood, it's not a problem. Uh, but the date, it's uh, quite a problem for our young players. Yeah, but uh, again, uh, quite a valid comment. That's always been a consideration. When should this actually be played? Uh, preferably, as you say, we need the national champions from, from, from the from the various countries, and, and we need those players who actually became champions for the players. So we, a lo logic thing is to play it after the, the national leagues. The, right now it's, it, it's played in June, which can collide with, with exams, but is, is, is there a better uh, time of the year to play it? It has to be after the national leagues, I guess. Uh, should it be late in the, later, on, uh, after the summer, later in the autumn? Do we still have the same teams? Do we still have the same players in those teams? Or, or, or how is it? But, but, but do you have better ideas for, for the players in the calendar? Again, it is something that we, uh, we want to consider, taking into consideration to, because it, it's, it's impossible to, to reach a, a unanimous decision about how the perfect format, how the perfect uh, scheduling is. 
But as one of the slow uh, slides show, it's your event, and we want to do what is what you actually would like us to do. And saying we don't want to do an event if uh, if 90% of our MAs are not in in favor of of this event. So if you have a better format, if you have a better idea for for placing it in the schedule, we are we are all ears by all means. Any further comments, questions? <clears throat> oh, but thank you very much to, to the ones of you uh, participating actively here. This is, as Emma mentioned earlier, we really want uh, you guys to to engage into this, and, and this was a good starting point in a, in a discussion. So, so thank you very much. And uh, during the Q and A session at the end of the day, if you have any further comments or questions, please come forward uh, or approach us during the, the networking session. Thank you. If we should just slightly continue then with the, uh, we have an agenda point upon the technical officials education. Uh, I just want to start up by saying, uh, some of you might have seen on our website, uh, published one week ago, but actually Thursday last week we, we lost one of our dear colleagues, uh, one of our good technical officials in, in Europe. Uh, accidentally, you can say he. We are in in Prague uh, this week. He Ivan Skacha died Thursday uh, last week, at uh, the age of uh, only 57. He was a former president of the Czech Badminton Federation. He was a well-known character among technical officials, an extremely good and, and liked colleague by by many in Europe. So. Given the circumstances, given the fact that he's actually going to be buried today, this is why the president of the Fed uh, Czech Federation is not with us now, he's attending his funeral, I would like to ask all of you to, to stand for a mo moment uh, and have a moment of silence in the honor of Ivan Skacha. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, much of this might seem uh, logic to some of you. Some of you might have will see this for the first time, but uh, as it was also mentioned during uh, one of Brian's uh, presentations, we are not all the same. Uh, we come from, from different federations, but uh, at the end of the day, we are here to to promote and to develop the sport and technical officials is, uh, is an important part of it. So if I should just take you through a short guide of, uh, of how our technical officials education is currently done and how it's uh, displayed. Technical official has his own, uh, own page, own side of our, our new website. It's just allocated just beneath our, our calendar. If you go into this section, you have a you have a section of, of the various uh, officials we're talking about, referees, umpires, line judges. This presentation will mainly uh, be around referees and umpires. So clicking on referees it takes you to this side, and on the referees page you will see on the left menu simply our procedure of how to educate our referees. And similar, when if you click umpires in the slide we saw before, we have a procedure of how to educate our umpires, the whole uh, ladder of, of how to do it. And there's also a, a list of where we educate, which courses, which appraisals, and which assessments are being done. So briefly, short, uh, shortly talking about uh, the education of referees, uh, what, we, what we do, obviously, as you know, uh, we don't need as many referees as we, as we do for umpires. So every three years, it's been decided to, to run a, a course. Uh, the Belgian Federation has been kind to host us the last two editions during a Belgium International, both where the referees can, can be educated, but also see, uh, be alongside a, a well-run tournament uh, so they can see how, how issues can arise and how issues can be dealt with. So they are, they're having some, some practical work alongside their theoretical uh, education. Uh, on our website, it can be found here, but if I just take you through step by step, as I said, one course every three years, 
to attend the course, we would require that uh, some experience is being held, and this is where you come into 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 the play. It's ex extremely important that you equip your your potential referees that they know what they're actually going into, that they know the various regulations, that they know how to work around being a referee on on domestic level. At our course, they are being instructed by the best in Europe. Our our referee assessment panel consists of the four European BWF certificate referees, which are the referees on the highest level in the world. And on the course, we do identify the, the best candidates. And then over the next three years, we continue working with the referees, building on their experience, and then simply offer them an assessment during, uh, during those three years. And once uh, an assessment is dealt with, if it's good enough, they will pass, because what we do in, in Europe is we, wa we want to make the best officials in the world, and the referees are an extremely part of this. Umpires level uh, is not that much different to, to referees, but the focus that we have mainly is the one called BEC accredited and BEC certificated, meaning the European continental level before going on to BWF level, which are the best in the world. The bottom part is where I need your help. We need your help on educating the umpires on national graded uh, level. That being working in your domestic tournaments, that meaning uh, sending your best umpires abroad to get the experience before moving up the ladder. During our education for, for umpiring, we, we do try to, to reach all umpires, all levels of umpires we have in Europe by three activities. The first one is, a, is an umpire course, which is uh, for national graded umpires, for them to get the theory on uh, to reach a higher level. They're going to officiate at, uh, at our circuit tournaments. Then we talk about appraisals, which is actually an on-site uh, evaluation of the umpires. The umpires are being uh, looked at and te teached by our assessment panel. And then you have actually as assessments, which are exams for umpires to go to a higher level. Our umpire courses are held two to three times every year. Uh, this year we are having in, uh, in Latvia, in uh, Romania, and in... Slovakia, yes, how, how can I forget, yeah. So alongside circuit tournaments, they are umpiring at tournaments, as I said, and then instructed and, and taught by our assessment panel. It contains a theory and actual umpiring, and then our best candidates are being identified, so they will be put forward for, for assessment in the, in the coming years. As I said, we want to be, we want to have the best officials in the world. But, where, again, we need to have your help is to we need to identify the ideal candidates for, for before going to the courses. We cannot accept uh, umpires that have never umpired uh, internationally, that has not umpired on a, on a decent level. So this is what we actually need you to make sure that your umpires have before putting them forward to a, to a course under Babington Europe. Appraisals is the next step. Uh, as I said, it's going to be uh, supervised and we want to identify the best ones we have. Simply, we, we want to have as much transparency in this area as, as possible. We don't want to send forward people forward just because they have been serving the longest or just because they are good friends with someone who is, might, might be able to put them forward. We want to identify the best ones and that is being done over a number of tournaments every year by our uh, assessment panel, which consists of current BWF uh, umpires or former BWF umpires. And we do it on two stages, Bef for the ones that are already uh, BAMS Europe accredited umpires, for them to take to the next level, and the ones that are BWF certificated in order to put them forward to, to BWF. And when they are then uh, selected for an assessment. This is, a, this is their exam. For, for the first level in Europe, it's strictly a practical exam. How do they perform? Uh, are they good enough to, to be recognized as international umpires? When then they are acknowledged as good enough to take to the next le uh, level, we start to introduce a written exam, 
because we know this is what BWF will anyway introduce to them when they, we move towards BWF. Therefore, we, we decided to introduce it on, on our level as well, simply to, to guide our umpires to prepare them as, as good as we possibly can. And just as a formality, uh, the final decision is, is taken in our, our major events commission, which are receiving the reports from, from the assessors. It's not, going, it's not something that is going to be discussed in long terms, but simply we, we, we get a report from our assessment panel and it's being brought forward to the, to the major commission, the major events commission, who are giving the final sign off. If you have any questions, simply just raise your hand. Ah, Sven, don't be shy. <coughs> any questions, any comments? And if not, that's all for me. But again, during the networking session, by all means, uh, approach me or approach Pavel, who is uh, assisting in the office uh, when it comes to technical officials, or approach the young gentleman in the picture. He is actually appointed by our, our board as an assistant to the... Uh, to the office working around technical officials. Sven is not only president of the Belgian Federation, he's also a BWF certificated umpire. So he's assisting us in, in, in our selections and our assessment procedures, and he's also part of our assessment panel. So he has a, he's in, in frequent contact with, with Pavel Nye in the office, and, and your help is, is much appreciated. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jimmy. So next up, we'll hear a little bit about the uh, summer school. So can I invite to the stage, we can see Jerome is on his way already. Will you have any assistance? Jean-Marc is coming as well. Two-man show. Welcome to the stage. We're going to sing a song. You want a song? He can sing very well. Nobody knows, but he can sing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Good. Um, the summer school. Um, the summer school is uh, the longest running Badminton Europe development project. Um, this year we're going to do the 36th uh, edition. And um, we basically make the biggest uh, change uh, when I started to work for Badminton Europe. Um, as a development manager, I got the responsibility to do the summer school. And when I discussed my work with Brian in the beginning, he said you also need to do the coach education in it. Um, because the BWF started to do uh, the coach education system. So that was the first time that we started to implement it. We had already done uh, some tutor courses before where we are supporting our members and educating uh, coaches who can then deliver the courses in the country. But we also have members who are small, and in order to give them uh, a good opportunity to also educate people, we are doing coach education during the summer school. Wrong way, sorry. Um, when I started, I, I had to think of how to do a summer school. Um, I have, of course, a, a background in, in high performance, Summer school is, is something, was something new for me. And I had a lot of talks with coaches and players who has been in the past in the summer school, how the summer school was running. 
And um, in those days, the coach education has been part of it, but um, it was not a certified uh, system. And now we had specific tasks from, from, from the BWF how to implement it. So I, I was thinking, and what, what can we do in, in a week, uh, in those six days? Um, when I talked to the coaches, we more or less agreed that we cannot improve the players um, extremely, but we can give them experiences of coaches from different cultures. Um, my team that I selected are also widely selected coaches from, from Europe. Um, other information that I received is that, that some players were working with the same coach the whole week. So I also made the change that these players got a lot of different coaches and got a lot of experience and then can select what they like to bring home. If you look at the schedule here, um, you can see that there's a, a lot of training. Um, in the last years, we have uh, had around 45 to 50 players, which is a lot. So we divided the, the, the 50 players into two groups of 20 or 25, depending on how many there were. Um, so one group is doing something uh, like stretching or some weight training, or it can be uh, an activity that they are doing in the group. But it can also be that they are, if we had a very nice location, do some swimming or some aqua jogging. Um, and the other group is working in the hall, and they are working with the staff coaches. So we have four to six players on the court working very individual um, with the staff coaches. Um, the feedback that we got on that was that it's very positive. And we also build in the, um, uh, the coach education. So the players are also working uh, with the coach who are, who are being educated. So overall, that was working fine. So for the players, more individual uh, coaching with, with the staff coaches. Uh, the players do not have the same uh, coach every time. And the players are experience, experiencing different <coughs> coaching styles. Um, we, as a team, we got feedback from, from the players, what they think of the summer school. We got feedback from the coaches. Uh, Sean Mark and me, we got feedback from the staff coaches, and they are, of course, very precise, and we have made those changes during the years. Um, what we would like to also hear from you as members is your feedback on our summer school, because that's the only part that we are missing now. Um, we would like to get feedback, good or bad, or things we can change. If we then go on, for the coaches, uh, and how do I make this? Does this work? No. Um, the coaches are not so much involved anymore as they used to be, from the inf information that I got. Before, they were doing a session every day, or more sessions every day with the players, where the staff coaches were behind, and, and giving feedback on the sessions, now it's more divided. Um, so many times the coaches who are being educated are sitting in a classroom, getting tasks, um, working with me, working with the staff coaches, and they will also deliver uh, sessions where they are working with the players and where they get di direct feedback from, from, from the coaches, uh, from the staff coaches. Another advantage is now that we give a, a level one course and a level two course. Um, this schedule here is from last year. And as you can see on the first day, we also uh, build in a shuttle time course. 
a shuttle time teacher course. Uh, that was the first time that we did that um, because in our team we had discussions about it and, and we felt that for many uh, coaches it's also good to uh, experience shuttle time and the response was uh, good. Um, in, in, in the shuttle time course there's a lot of interaction between the, 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 the coaches, they are delivering to each other. So we had a very good build up of, of the team and they started to know each other uh, very quickly and very well. Um, then in this schedule you can see it is tough because uh, they're busy during the day getting the sessions, delivering sessions and in the evenings we are doing uh, theory where they do all the paperwork, where they have all the questions and we prepare them for the next day and what we see is they are working hard, they are working very hard and late. Yeah. Good. So, sorry. so for the coaches, um, the change has been that they are able, because we also make sessions where they can observe the staff <coughs> coaches work. Um, they can of course not interfere too much in the practice, but they can talk. And, and get to know how the staff coaches are working. Um, that's very much appreciated. Um, then, after the deliveries, they get immediately feedback from the staff coaches. That's also received very positively. And then also the certification, a level one or a level two. Yeah. And again, we would like, Jean-Marc and I, we would like to receive feedback on, on uh, on what we're doing here. Maybe we make mistakes, maybe we can do things differently. Good. Going back to going back to this schedule. Um, this is how it how it's been the last years. And Jean Marc, you would like to add on some things, some ideas? Yeah, for the last two years uh, I've been as an observer at the summer school. And uh, when I have some discussion with the coaches there and also with some people outside when I come back because I have some sharing uh, after also, uh, what can we see? For the last two years, I've seen 17 countries of us, European countries. Around 46 players, 45 to 50, but almost 45, 46 players and almost 24 to 25 coaches. Uh, mostly the same countries are coming again. So we are missing some, what I, what, what I can say is uh, we are missing one of the biggest countries. But I remember me uh, a few years ago, not too long, not too far from now, a few years ago, I was in the summer school and I get something from the summer school. And uh, I think if we want to improve ourselves, and if we want to improve our level in Europe, we don't, have to, we, we don't only have to use summer school as a first step for me to go into the high level, and after I, fo I forget. So I think at the moment we are all together here, and I think that I can see Denmark, I can see France, I can see Germany, and uh, I would like them to be more involved into the summer school, but maybe not as a coach to be educated, but more as an experienced coach to come with a bigger knowledge and to help us to make the first step better and better. So I think if we get experiences from them on specific topics, maybe the standard level of the first step of the high level standard will be higher in Europe and if we are higher in Europe when we are young, maybe we expect to be higher at the higher level when we will be older at the senior level. So this is, this is maybe from my observation, what I can say now. And I'm sure before starting the summer school, you can see on the, on the timetable that the summer school is starting on Saturday afternoon. I would like maybe to make the proposition to all of you to get half day before and to start on Friday afternoon 
around a specific topic coming from the biggest country from badminton. I would like to have the top coaches from Denmark, the top coaches from France, top coaches from Germany to come and to put all the coaches who are going to be educated during the week in a specific mind about what can it become tomorrow for you. You're starting at the coach level one or coach level two, but tomorrow, what do we expect? To be stronger in the world for Europe. So to become stronger in the world, we need, what is its intensity in, uh, in training? What is, what is mental strength in coaching? So maybe we have different topics we can put in only for one day and a half, but they can stay also until, until Sunday, just to share with everyone, just to, to share a high-level culture. I think we're missing this at the moment in the summer school. We are quite strong to educate. I think the program is very good. We have very positive remarks from uh, all the participants, but I think we're missing something. We're missing how to build a stronger first step. This is my mind, and I wanted to share with you, and maybe you can come to us to say if it's, I'm wrong or I'm right. It's up to you. So, exactly what I said. Yeah. <laughs> so basically a sort of a name like a small summer university. Yeah where we start two to three days before, or one and a half day before. Yeah. Uh, focus on one subject, and for coaches and other people who are yeah. interested. Yeah, it can, be, it, it can be also open to all the countries to come, and only for the day and a half, for the weekend. It's shorter, less expensive, but I'm sure that it can improve our European level. The discussion is open. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So if you don't have any questions or any input yet, we would like to receive that later in the Q&A. Mm. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And now, ISF? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, go, yeah. go, go. Yeah, here. <laughs> Which one? Uh, that one. Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Yeah, so, sorry, and, and it's a question to you, actually, and, and maybe... For me Should or have, for? for both of you. Right. Okay. So because we're now touching on, on the summer school, which is a, it's, it's, it's a high performance type of activity. And obviously, yeah, we, we are in a room with quite a lot of uh, administrators, of which some are coaches potentially or work coaches and players. Well, but it, it is yeah. well, so it, the, it, the thing, so, yeah. sorry, um, it, it is under the Sport for All Commission. Yeah, whatever so, it, it, yeah. it sits. But my point is, do we survey the coaches that have participated in the summer school in a, in a kind of an official way, in a kind of an electronic um, a kind of survey that we send to them to get their opinion on these type of topics, because that, that could be an interesting one. And, and I'm sorry to just throw that at you now, but I think if we can keep interacting with coaches that have previously been on summer schools to basically get their input on some of those points, I think that would be valuable as well, because we here can provide a bit of information, but probably those coaches uh, that have been, if we have a kind of a list of people that have been at a summer school where we periodically send some service to, um, that, that would be a good idea for us to make the summer school better. So it's just a, a suggestion. We, we, we received a, a lot of input from the coaches who, who took part. We also received a lot of feedback from, from, from the staff coaches. Uh, so there's one more question. But it's a, it's a good idea to keep on coming back to them. Yeah, yeah. And Michael from Ireland. We, we do support the summer school both with players and with coaches and have done for many years. Uh, I was on the one, the second one ever and 35 years ago. Uh, so it, we, do, we do understand its value. Uh, it's value to the coaches. Good suggestion from Mark. It's value from the coaches coming back. They are our junior national coaches typically. Uh, but aren't wholly experienced and having access to perhaps an international more experienced coach I think would would benefit them particularly. Our feedback from our players uh, as always they are completely motivated when they come back from the course 
it is a, it, it's an excellent training tool for them. It opens their eyes as to what is out there and the experience that can be gained from making friends internationally. And many of our players who have come through our system, our high performance players, have also been through the summer school. So we are a great supporter of that and would like, like it to continue without tinkering too much with it. I think the format's great, uh, but a good suggestion from Mark. Thank you. No more? Good. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you want to. Yeah, and for the, la for the last part, remember two years ago, we, uh, we had here, uh, not here, but uh, physically, but we had uh, a presentation from uh, Laurent Petrinka, if you remember, the president of uh, ISF, and um, he wanted to develop a European level for badminton. And uh, we worked with him for two years, and uh, we are really happy now uh, to present you the first European school championship. I think this is another way, working with school projects, to go into more badminton at school and to go into more badminton at the end for everyone and to uh, improve our, member, our membership. So it was, a, it, it was an idea at the beginning, two years ago. It became true now because we will have it in next June in France. No? Sophia? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you have everything on the, vi on the video. So, yeah. The city of Clermont-Ferrand is a city in the centre of France and uh, they will take the part in the first one and uh, I hope that every two years we can have a European champ school championship. That means for 2019 we are looking for someone, maybe with ISF. So what we have in, this, uh, in the first school championship also, we're going to test uh, a, new, a new way of competing, is the rally competition. So the, we're, we're going to use a, a team event and we will play as a rally, in a rally. So to, uh, to 100, 207 points, but we are, we are still working on the, on the regulation at the moment because uh, uh, we have also worked with the young umpires and, they will, uh, and they, they, will, they will make everything, all of the job, they will do it in English. So everybody going to speak English. And around the competition, there is also a sharing with an Erasmus project, as you see. So the, the youth from uh, Europe will have time to talk about education and uh, everything around badminton. And the last thing, it's not on the video, is the, we're going to have the demonstration with the new synthetic shuttle in this event also. He's arriving, so for school it's less expensive, but it's a better way to play badminton. So we're gonna test it in June in Clermont-Ferrand. So you're welcome if you want to be in Clermont-Ferrand for a few days. I'll be there, so you can come. <laughs> voilà. No question, thank you. Thank you, Jean Marc. Thank you, Jerome. That was the summer school.
and it was uh, the School Sports Federation uh, Championships happening now in June. Uh, the next topic will be presented by Klaus Andreasen, and we are going to talk about women in badminton and specifically around also the, the award we are giving, the Badminton for Women Award. So, uh, Klaus, stage is yours. And thank you, and uh, as Brian and uh, Gregory has said, it's nice to see so many familiar faces, but also all the new faces, and I'll try to do it in time until our lunch break, which should be at 12 o'clock. But uh, actually, I know we have at least six new faces here, all women, Tamara from Belgium, Aneta from Bulgaria, Joanne from Mount Malta, Maria from Moldova, Sonia, Sonia from Portugal, and Jana from Slovakia. So a warm welcome to you too. I will talk to you brief through our policies. Two years ago in Paris, we uh, changed the rules and trying to get women more involved also stating in our rules. And in our terms of reference, we clearly say we want to strengthen and establish the role of women in European badminton community, encourage the development for female representation in all member associations. I will take you shortly through a BWF analysis made on gender representation and a special female representation, both the participation, the opportunity, the equity, and how women badminton uh, runs. We use the word equity and not equality. Equality, that's general centers from providing the same topics to everybody, the same opportunity giving the same uh, thing to everybody. While equity uh, talking is talking about doing the right things for those persons who are involved. That could be one thing for one person and another thing for another person. You can see it here from the report. Also, uh, providing the same level for everybody wouldn't help Jimmy together with uh, Sean, because his own will be high up because of his sight. No, we should try to get the uh, same opportunities or give the same possibilities to everyone to, to develop. The key issue is it's not a uh, women issue, it's a human issue. It's, we want to support and we want to support both genders. As, as Sharon Springer said, she's from the BWF uh, Development uh, Department. Uh, in the report we have used, it's vital to incorporate women into existing structures and system rather to, uh, create, than creating parallel courses and groups that are limited to women. Only thus can we reach the end goal of women, not as female leaders, but as leaders. And uh, I think it's really wise words, and that's what we have been working with in the Commission for the last couple of years. And how are you doing in the MAs about that? We have tried to put some figures up on uh, figures of the numbers from your federations and how we are doing in BEC. And we have also looked at how we implement uh, teachers in shuttle time, coaches and technical officials. And uh, Numbers tells itself. In the board of directors, we only have 15% of uh, female representation. 
that is not, uh, not something we can do anything about because it depends on how you select or elect the people to participate in here and voting for the persons that you find the right persons to do. Where BEC can do something is in commissions, and you can see we have 35% female representation there. And we have looked at the current states of the member association, the presidents there, and yeah, your memberships has chosen only 14% or in 14% of the countries have chosen female presidents. But that's not saying all. But what, how are we doing in the other terms? In technical officials, that's effectuous. Please be aware that some of the areas I have here, we have a limited number of technical officials as referees. So it could also tell when we have a, a very small, small number of uh, people in the survey, we can, uh, it could be a, uh, oh, I can't uh, put the right word. In shuttle time, look at the good numbers. Look at the really good numbers. It is really done something to involve women of both genders into the education. We have more female shuttle time teachers than male female uh, male uh, teachers. When we look at the also on, on expert level, we also have a third of them as female. On coach education level one. Here, you, here are the numbers here. Coach uh, uh, education level two. But we do not have many experts in all, so that could be the explanation that they, we only have, what's the number, I can't read, 14%. The Badminton and Women Commission have been working for some years now, and what we are doing as actions is we look for the ways to get women involved in the current structures, governance, coaching, officiating. We implement measure, we try to implement measures to prepare women for leadership roles, target tearing, mentoring. That is some of the things we want both in Badminton Europe, but also we want you as MAs to do. Try to involve both genders in the sport of Badminton. We do it in the on-court and we should do it off-court too. We said, try to set meaningful objectives around the female participation. We shouldn't select women because they're women we should select them because they're the right persons. So find the right places to put, give them opportunities. And find the right places to give men opportunities. What we also have been doing for the last two years now, last year was the first year we introduced scholarships. Last year we had scholarships on coach education, we had scholarships on uh, participating here at the ADM and the forum, and we had scholarships for technical officials. And you can see the member association who benefited of the scholarships last year. And this year, we have uh, broadened it out. Besides the three well-known scholarships, we have two scholarships on uh, Parabadminton players or female parabadminton players, as Xiao told you uh, earlier. We have six countries benefiting of a scholarship here at the ADM. We have uh, granted four scholarships on the coach education already, and we have four pending. 
because they had to fulfill all the criteria to get the scholarships. The same on uh, technical officials. Uh, we have now granted six scholarships there. And that's one of the way we want to help you to have female representation on the kind of, uh, different levels. And let get both genders on the, uh, we could have a video here, but as lunch is coming up, we won't show the video. The last uh, item I will like to point out is tomorrow night, we are going to award the uh, uh, Women in Badminton Award, and that will be for the last time. Because we will introduce a new award instead of the Badminton, uh, Women in Badminton Award, and call it Badminton for Women Award. And why change the wordings? Yeah because we want to uh, honor the person who do something to get women into badminton. It can also be a man that should be awarded that, having that award, it could be. You will get a letter uh, here in April from us uh, how to uh, apply for the award for 2017. It is member associations who uh, nominate it. When you make a nomination, we will try to make an article on the website from Badminton Europe. And then, as we do still, it will be the awards panel that decides who will get the award next year. So it's the same, but not the same. And the last one, you know, questions. Short questions because we have a lot of uh, time this afternoon to talk together. And uh, I would really especially like to talk to all the newcomers to this uh, forum and uh, ADM because it's nice to meet new people. But if you have any questions to this presentation here, please. Doesn't seem, to be. Doesn't seem to be the case, Klaus. So thank you very much. <laughs> that concludes the morning. And uh, I've been told that uh, lunch is served. It will be up on the first floor where you had your breakfast this morning. And we will reconvene down here again at one o'clock. So one hour lunch, we meet here again at one o'clock. Thank you very much and see you in one hour.
Well, it's one o'clock, eh? It's one o'clock. <laughs> I already thought it was near noon here. Which is fine. <coughs> Not here anything. Somebody needs to go there first and bring them. Do you want me to go and have a look? I'm going to present you now okay, in 30 seconds. Okay, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Sorry. In 30 seconds. Come on, Victor, do it. Come on, see ya. Ready? Let's go. Hi. <laughs> You're late. Yeah, to my, to my own event. <laughs> Who? Kristen, he had a call. I'm not sure he will be uh, on time. But I'll be brave enough to start without him. We are ready. We are ready to start in uh, two minutes. We'll start in two minutes.
Okay, I think we cannot uh, wait much longer. It must have been a very good lunch. It's difficult to get people back in the room. So we're going to start the afternoon session. And uh, first up will be, I'll just take you through the program to buy a little bit of time for those still coming in from lunch. Um, so first we'll be uh, hearing about the new European Badminton Training Center. We have some guests from Holbeck who are coming to help us present uh, the, the, the location and the facilities up in Holbeck. And, uh, and that will be followed by um, a, top, a topic called Why Social Media? where Mark Feeland and, uh, and Emma Lollick is going to give you uh, some, uh, some insights on, on why we should use social media. That's followed by the networking session, which we started already a little bit this morning during the coffee break, where you have a chance to um, dwell on what, uh, what you heard so far during the, the day, and, uh, and if there's something that you then uh, feel that you have not had answered, there's a, there's a Q&A afterwards where you can where you can fire as much as you want with questions and we'll try to answer as good as we can. Well, I think we are probably as many as we will be, so um, can I ask to the stage uh, Richard Warren. Richard is the chair of the High Performance Commission. Jerome van Dijk, our manager, who will be who's working mainly with um, with, uh, with our high performance and the, and the center. And from, uh, from Holbeck also, uh, I'm not sure if you need to take the stage immediately, you will sort that out between yourself, but at least I'll introduce you. So we have uh, Pierre Fauerbill, um, who is uh, from the, from the uh, school and uh, that also provides facilities in, uh, in Holbeck. Um, it's called Stenhus Gymnasium. Uh, I'm not, probably not gymnasium, it's probably not the right translation, but it's a high school. Um, and they're also offering other education, uh, like the International Baccalaureate. Um, and also, uh, Carsten Damgaard is here next to him. And Carsten is from uh, the foundation Holbeck Sportsby and uh, has been our, our main um, partner in, uh, in presenting the bid and negotiating the bid uh, from, from Holbeck. So um, thank you for making or taking the time to come down here and, uh, and help with the presentation. And also thanks for for joining over the weekend for the celebrations as well. Good to see you here. So, uh, Richard, over to you. Okay, I think uh, most people are back. So as uh, Brian introduced, um, we're all gonna do a small presentation on our various pieces. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to uh, thank you um, all for coming today. Uh, I'm chair of the, the High Performance Commission. Uh, a bit of background on me. I was a, a top badminton player. So I was a coach, I was a manager, administrator across uh, many countries in Europe. Uh, I was a world number seven player in singles, uh, won European and Commonwealth medals. Um, I guess coming from a really small country, so for those that don't know, I'm from Wales. So Wales is one of the few countries that aren't here today. Uh, I received very little support in my, my development as a player, and I think um, the dream of having a European training center was, yeah, it wasn't even a thought when, it, when I was developing. Uh, from my own experiences, I, I guess I understand the struggles of many of the small to medium-sized countries. I think everybody here knows a really good, talented player that failed to reach their potential because there was nowhere for them to go, <clears throat> to, to kind of grow, to, to learn, and um, to have that support in terms of uh, coach support and, and the complete holistic uh, training environment. Uh, we now have that in Holbeck, in, in Denmark. Uh, Holbeck was announced last month as the, as the winning tender of the High Performance Center. Uh, it went through a very rugged uh, selection process where we had nine very good bids from member associations. Uh, Bampton Europe is already advertising for, for a head coach for the center. We've already had one uh, selection camp and we have another one coming up in May. So it's uh, all moving uh, full steam ahead with uh, the centers throwing the doors open next uh, September. 
So why Holbeck? Uh, as you'll see from the, the future presentations, I'll, I'll leave uh, Carsten to tell you more about Holbeck and, and the specifics. But uh, they had a very, very strong uh, bid. They had a great uh, collaborative approach between the club, college, and commune, which not only provides excellent settings and facilities, but it was also very um, competitive on price. Uh, Democ, for those that don't know, provides uh, free healthcare. It provides free education. The college even has its own uh, education course in English. Uh, obviously, Democ has a very strong badminton history, so within 30, 40, 40 minutes drive of, of the center, there are many top clubs for players to, to play, uh, to coach, and um, opportunity for sparring players the other way. So <clears throat> it was a really uh, strong uh, bid all around, and um, I'd like to thank, in particular, all the member associations that, that were part of the process for submitting their tenders. Uh, there wasn't a bad one. They were all very, very strong, and it made the the final decision very difficult, but I think as a board, we were, we were um, comfortable that the, the Holbeck um, training center bid was the strongest. So with that, I'd just like to invite uh, Carson to tell us a bit more on, on the Holbeck offer. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And yes, I would say that Pierre and I, we are really proud to be here together with, with you. What a wonderful view from my part here. I don't know if you have similar uh, view, but uh, it's, up, it's up to you to decide. Uh, Richard, very uh, uh, price-wise uh, uh, competitive hour bit, you should have told us a bit before. <laughs> now, first of all, thank you to, uh, to uh, President uh, Mr. Gregory, the Board of Directors, BEC staff, badminton friends uh, from all Europe uh, for inviting us here to your uh, uh, weekend in, uh, in Prague and a very congratulations with your 50 years anniversary. We are, it's a great honor for us to be here. Uh, I will present uh, our Holbeck Sportsby uh, to you. And uh, I will say, start to say that you are going to execute a unique high performance center of excellence. We are in the process to, pick, to build unique Holbeck Sportsby. Uh, so together we will make the platform for, for European badminton talents to grow on highest top level in the, in the world. Uh, at least we will do the efforts and, and we hope so. In Holbeck, we have some strong stakeholders working together about uh, in, in such a project project like uh, Center of Excellence. We have uh, there Holbeck community. Uh, our community is uh, 71 uh, in, in, in uh, inhabitants, and uh, Holbeck City is about 30,000 30, inhabitants. And I have the best greetings from our major in Holbeck. He has been a part of the bit as well as uh, Pierre and I and some of the other stakeholders. Holbeck Erwerbs Forum is uh, the organization in Holbeck for about five, 550 companies, small, medium, and bigger companies working together with us on, the, on this project. We have Stenhus High School, Stenhus Gymnasium, Stenhus Sports College, which is one of the biggest high schools in Denmark, and I would say, Pierre, probably the best uh, high school and sports college we have in Denmark. And I, th I hope that you will see that, uh, that the competences and the test center is on top level in Denmark and probably in the world as well. And no money, 
no cookies. We have our financial partner, Sparkassen Sjælland, which is very important in realizing Holbæk Sportsby and, uh, and this project, the Center of Excellence. We really look forward working together with you and the BEC staff uh, to, to make the frame that we can higher the level of performance of U European badminton players. Uh, the, the infrastructure in, uh, in Holbeck and uh, in, uh, uh, regarding the center of excellence is relatively good. In the picture, you have a, a picture from, from a plane over Holbeck. We, we, we live close to a harbor, really uh, cozy harbor. I hope that some of you, probably all of you, will visit Holbeck in the future and uh, just give, you a, give, give us a call and then we take care of, of you. Denmark here, Zealand, and there we have uh, Holbeck. A bit closer, we, Holbeck is on Zealand, uh, and uh, here you have the airport, and as Richard uh, told us, uh, 45 minutes from the airport, 15 minutes to the center of Copenhagen, and then for around about 45 minutes by car or train to, uh, to Holbeck. So it's, it's relatively good infrastructure for international uh, badminton players. We come a bit closer. The pictures there again is from, from Holbeck, our old harbor with a lot of restaurants and cafes. And in this springtime, as we have now in Prague as well, it's, it's really nice to be in Holbeck. There we have the main street with a lot of cafes and, and, and really you can spend a nice time there. And I'm not here to advertise Holbeck, but, and, and I would not say that the, the, the center of excellence players should not spend most of their time in, in those areas, but we have it when you, in, when you visit Holbeck. We have the place here, and here we have Holbeck Station, and it's two kilometers from Holbeck Sports, Sports Bute, so uh, it's rather close. Here we have Stenhus, where we have the test center and uh, badminton courts as well. Uh, so there again, the infrastructure is uh, rather good. Here we have the highway from Copenhagen, and when you drop off the highway, you have by car two minutes uh, to the Holbeck Sportsby. The place where Holbeck Sportsby is uh, in process to be built, the machines are, uh, they are working uh, on the area right now. It is 42 hectares, uh, all in all, outdoor and indoor. It's soccer fields, it's paddle tennis, it's outdoor tennis, it's athletics, it's uh, petanque. We, we collect, I would say, all kinds of sports facilities in, uh, in, in Holbeck uh, Sportsby. And there you have the building, and the building is going to be 22,000 square meters uh, indoor with different kinds of sports uh, facilities. You have there an overview uh, from Holbeck Sportsby and, and the surroundings. And I can say now that the soccer field there, it, it is some architect, architectural uh, designs. It's not going to be like that way in, w w when we are going to play football. Uh, we step inside the, the building here, the main entrance here. To the left, we have the arena, two handball halls in size, and when we have a U European champion in badminton, for instance, we can do it here, the size to the roof, and uh, uh, spectators for uh, 3,000, uh, around 3,000 spe spectators, uh, we can build it up to really nice uh, champions uh, uh, area. Here we have Holbeck Community Healthcare Center with all specialists that you can dream about. We have a restaurant and cafe, of course. Here we have the tennis center, tennis hall with four indoor 
tennis court squash here. Uh, and here comes the badminton center with eight badminton courts and uh, will be at your at center of ex excellence disposition as we have agreed. And of course, we have a lot of meeting rooms. We have working station also for staff in, uh, in Center of Excellence and Badminton Europe. Uh, when we go on the first floor, uh, we have a, a, a players zone here. All the different clubs and players, they, uh, they have to use the same zone. So they have to, to meet a badminton player, can meet a football player, can meet a tennis player, etc. And both for high performance, top level, uh, sport performance, and medium, and for those people who will just do sport for, for fun. We have areas especially for, for high performance uh, sports uh, people. Here we have an excellent swimming center with a 50 meter swimming bassin. And here we have uh, some fun places. Here we have a warm heated uh, bassin. And here we have a family and uh, kids uh, bassin. And here, of course, all the facilities after what we have agreed, uh, the, the badminton players, center of excellence players, have e access to, uh, to those uh, facilities. There you see a 3D model. There is some changing in uh, the badminton courts because here you have four tennis uh, courts and here you have the eight uh, badminton courts. Together with Stenhus uh, High School, Stenhus High School is placed two, three minutes from, from this building. We have altogether 23 badminton courts and the, uh, the arena where we can make the, the European tour tournaments when we want that. You can see here, here we have the Holbeck Sportsby. There we have Stenhus High School, Holbeck Station, and the harbor and the center here in the uh, and here we have the highway where buses and uh, cars come directly to Holbeck Sportsby. The permanent uh, accommodations for the players and trainers, uh, managers for the center of excellence, we have the building here, we have the stadium, football stadium here, and we built a new building right here where we have brand new accommodations, uh, small apartments, small, uh, about 40 square meters per apartment for the young players. They can live one player, or they can live two players in, uh, in each apartment. It's, uh, you can save a little bit money per player when you want to live two in the same apartment, but you can live alone when you want that. There you can see the accommodation, the apartment for, for the players, where we here have a, a lounge, a, a kitchen room uh, where you can eat and or you can yeah, may, uh, do your laptop uh, bathroom here, uh, storage, uh, relaxing room, and here you have the, the bedroom. And the rooms will, or the apartments I should say, will be furnished from our part, so they are ready when the players come to us from September, end of August, uh, something like that. Yeah, I will give to Pierre and I come back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm headmaster at Stenhus Gymnasium, 1,300 students. We have both a Danish uh, education and international IB, international baccalaureate education. Right now we have students from 21 countries at our school on the international baccalaureate. We also have exchange students from many countries in the world. Some of you might wonder about what's going to happen in September this year, because all what you have been shown until now hasn't been finished yet. And the answer is that Badminton Europe 
will be hosted at my school for the first one and a half year. This is our new hall and it's finished. The presentation of the new Center of Excellence was taken there. It's the same architect and the same uh, company who is building the sports by. We have, of course, as you can see, a badminton hall, six courts. We have an office for badminton Europe. We have rooms for physical um, treatment. We have uh, meeting rooms for one for 30 people, players, and we have a big meeting room for up to 100 people. We have a dance hall up there for physical training without weights. And that's only part of our school because we have two halls more with nine courts. So all in all, we had 15 courts at our school. And uh, we have a lot of outdoor facilities. We have a training center if you have to do weights. And as you see here, we have a test center together with the University of Copenhagen. And we have employed a researcher uh, together with the university. So we have the newest equipment for testing physical. This is, as you know, the maximum erop. And uh, so we can do all the testing. And down here, you might, I'm not sure you can see, it's Joachim Fischer. He's trying our functional badminton test, the Müller test. One of our teachers has developed a test for badminton. He has tested all the top Danish players and uh, a PhD, and uh, we can also test in functional test your players. And Christian is part of our badminton college together with this man, Peter R., former head coach in New Zealand. Next year, he'll be our new leader of our badminton college. So it'll be Peter, who's employed at my school and my sports college and in the local badminton club, and I hope you'll use him at your center of excellence together with Christian. So he'll also like to help you at the center of excellence. And this picture to show that we have a sports college with 105 talented students in basketball, badminton, handball, tennis, and soccer. In fact, right now, our baton basketball club is competing to be the best uh, under 19 Boys in Denmark, they are number two for the time being. So we have a lot of experience dealing with uh, talented young people in sports. They start at seven o'clock in the morning doing physical training. Then they go to school until three o'clock in the afternoon. And then they practice again 15 to 20 hours a week. It's very important for young people that they can do their sport, but they can also get an education, and uh, they can do it in English at our school. And this is where the students are going to live until the sports view is finished. So at my school, they can stay, and in two minutes, they then go to the sports hall, and go to the physical training center, go to the test center, and uh, we provide them with food. We have a kitchen or a cafe, you might call it, with three chefs, so we can provide them with food also. So can, they can have their whole life in a circle about 50 meters. I think that it would be a very good start for the center of excellence to start in very close connection to my school because we have a lot of students they can uh, make social relations to so they don't feel that they are put away just outside everything but they can be a part of their life in our city and we can take care of their social uh, connections with other young people and I think it's very important to uh, see for life skills when uh, you have to train as much as these guys or girls are going to do. We have to take care of them so they feel that uh, they won't miss anything. And uh, that's what we are going to do for the first one and a half years. After that, we will 
help the Center of Excellence in any ways they want to get our help. Yes, and I have to say, we can't wait. We are so excited, we are so proud that we got the contract. And uh, you have a unique project in Center of Excellence. We have a unique uh, Holbeck sports bu with all the facilities, and I'm sure that we together can make those world-class European badminton players. The last slide from our, from our side here, you have four, picture, you have four pictures, uh, f two from, from inside. It, it is the design-wise which, uh, which is going to be uh, implemented inside. I just have to say, and I hope that we can wish you all welcome in Holbeck uh, to our unique facilities. Thank you for the contract, and we will do our very best. Thank you, Karsten. Um, well, we have another five months till we open, so we have a lot of work in progress at the moment. Um, here is the schedule, and we are still in close contact and talking about it, how we're going to do it. But we're going to uh, offer five morning sessions, those are badminton sessions, and two in the afternoon, evening. <clears throat> that can either be on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, can also be other days. Um, as Per said before, there's a badminton college um, at the gymnasium, and we could also work together with them. So that's what we are going to offer them. Then, um, we would like to have a head coach there. Um, is also a work in progress. Um, an assistant coach. Um, also, because we're in Denmark, we're going to have part-time coaches involved. This is all work in progress, as I said before. Um, I will be heavily involved as well. I will might do some sessions as well, and I'm managing the, uh, the, the center. Then the players. Um, as said before, we have had our pre-selection camp in Vian. Uh, there we got a very good uh, picture of which players are interested. Um, we had around 35 players there. Um, many are interested in short stay. Um, at the moment, we have around 10 to 12 players who are already interested in coming to Holbeck and practice there. And that's even before we have the selection camp going on. So hopefully at the end of May, June, we will have a clear picture of who is going to the center. And our main goal is at the moment to, to create a group who is going to practice there permanently. How we are going to deal with players who want to be there short term, that will be information at a later stage. Then we also going to provide a medical service. Um, that will be in the form of a masseur or a physiotherapist. Um, once a week or every second week, they're going to get treatment. So we keep them in perfect health. And then we're going to have a doctor connected to it as well. Um, the details are, are to be discussed. But I said before, we have five more months to do that. That was it so far from us. Um, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Then, Brian. Sorry, yeah, I forgot that, sorry. Um, we have still because we have the selection camp from the 1st of uh, May to the 5th of May, um, we, we still received uh, entries the last days. So we have made the decision to extend the deadline until Friday. So if you still have people, uh, players who are interested, they can still come to us and then we might select them for, for the selection camp. 
Sorry, I have a question about school. Uh, it's possible that uh, our new potential uh, players will uh, also uh, be students of your school? I, or how it's... How it's will if they have the abilities to uh, go to our IB college, then they could do. Yeah, we, but we also have foreign students who take their education at home where we support them at our school. If they are part of a system before they come, they can continue and we can help them with mentors. And sometimes it might be a good solution. Because as I know, the students from, from Latvia and X is very interesting also about study, of course. Both. Yep. But we will help them. Are they at high school level or are they at university level? University. We have close connections to a university uh, three ki 30 kilometers from there where they have education in English. So we can help them to get in contact. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> So thank you to, uh, to Richard and to Jerome, Pierre and Carsten. That was our training center, which is coming up. Maybe just in addition to what, uh, what uh, Jerome and, and the others were saying, I think this uh, weekend is uh, an excellent opportunity to, uh, you know, to discuss possibilities around the training center for your players. Um, I had already a few discussions with some of you um, where you have shown interest in the past, where maybe there are questions around how can we, how can we finance it, what are the practical implications. So I, I think use this opportunity to come and speak with, uh, with Jerome, with myself, if it's more in, in terms of what, what happens in, uh, in, in Holbeck or at the school, you can go and speak with Carsten or Pei as well. I'm sure they'll be happy to, to discuss with you over the weekend. But um, the, the key here is really to... Uh, to um, you know, get a, a good group of, uh, of players together uh, in order to create another facility where we can build on the sub elite of, uh, of European badminton. Um, but we need to make sure we get the, the right players in as well, um, without, of course, jeopardizing what you're having at home. But uh, if there are any issues around the center, if you have questions around the facilities, around uh, coaches, what, they, what our plans are, what the ideas are, I'm sure Jerome has a few more answers up his sleeve than what he presented here about you know, the, the, um, the things that are going on that people we are talking with at the moment. So then go and take that offline with, with, with Jerome or with, with Richard as well. Um, and uh, please go back and see uh, and discuss with your high performance group or with your office at home and with your players. Still open to enter for the, for the selection camp from the 1st to the 5th of May. Um, so we'll, we'll be very happy to receive more nominations uh, next week. I think, Jerome, we can, uh, we can maybe just write that out to members as well to reinforce that in writing so they, they have it in the inbox also. Okay, thank you. So next is uh, regarding social media and why to use social media. And uh, here we have brought in some expert help. You can say... Um, Mark Phelan is doing a lot of work for us in terms of our social media, uh, also journalistic work. He's writing articles for us. Uh, he's doing interviews, uh, helping with our streaming productions. So he's a little bit of an octopus. He's doing, uh, he's doing everything more or less around our social media uh, uh, or assisting uh, in many ways. And, uh, and Emma, I'm not sure all of you uh, met Emma, but Emma started last year. Uh, so she is the anchor at the office and trying to uh, to uh, make sure that uh, that externals like like Mark, uh, who's working out of Ireland, is, is having enough to do for us, and a few others as well. So she's the anchor in the office. So they're going to talk with you about why social media. So please welcome on, welcome them on stage. Okay, thank you. Um, I just push this. Yeah, yes. Ooh, here we go. 
first, a little overview of what I will be talking to you about today. Um, we'll start with a short presentation and then go through what social media is and why it's different from just uh, the website, our website, your websites. And then I'm going to tell you about what we did during the European Mixed Team Championships in Poland recently. And I'm going to show you some of the tools that I, I'm using um, to schedule and make a strategy on the social media. And then in the end, Mark will talk to you about a shared photo database. Here we go. Um, as Brian just mentioned, I just started this July, last July, so I am still new. I feel like I'm still very new, but I am trying my best, and um, I hope that, yeah. Moving on, Mark is most of you might know me from being around at your circuit tournaments and so on and so forth. And uh, I am, what am I? I I'm, I'm a fan of badminton, uh, first and foremost, and it's in my blood. And uh, it's what I'm passionate about. And uh, through that passion, uh, I, I've got involved with the AIPS, which is the uh, world governing body for photojournalism and uh, uh, sports reporting. I'm on the badminton commission there with, uh, with Raphael Sachete of Badminton Photo and a few others, where, where we try and uh, improve the media facilities for uh, badminton journalists at events. And I also do a lot of commentary, interviews, etc. as Brian said. And I've been uh, working at, uh, freelance with Badminton Europe since, I think, I think it was the European Champion, Junior Championships in 2011, which was in uh, Finland. Okay, so uh, I found some definitions on what social media is, and Oxford Dictionary says that it's um, websites and applications that enable users to create and share content or to participate in social networking. And a more elaborating um, definition where I want to you to focus on this section where it's says it involves blogging and forums and any aspect of interactive presence which allows individuals the ability to engage in conversations with one another. So the keywords that I want you to take with you is interacting and engaging, because this is where social media stands out from the normal websites. Um, because when a user likes Badminton Europe's Facebook, they engage and become a part of a community online. So when they like us or like you, uh, your news and our news will circulate on their news feed and it will automatically become a part of their day. Um, because Facebook is where a lot of people go to scroll through, to pass through time. And this is where they will accidentally find uh, content. Um, and it's... And that way we can better lure them into our website by linking from um, linking articles or content from our website onto social media and in that way create um, traffic towards the website. That was the word. Um, another advantage that social media has is that it's a lot easier for the users and the fans to share our news, comment our news, and in that way help us promote the sport. Um, and a share from me or a like from me on my Facebook will make the news circulate on even my friends' Facebook, even though that they don't like Badminton Europe. So in that way we can not only reach our fans, but also the friends of our fans. To answer the main question, why social media? It's because of this. There's so many active users out there. This is numbers from the last quarter of 2016. And um, this is why we need to be there. In Europe, we have an estimated population of 823 million. 
and look how many of them are on Facebook. These are the people that we need to reach and also all of their friends. Um, so far, uh, we're doing pretty okay. This is an overview of Badminton Europe all the way out there to your left uh, compared to some of the other continental confederations and the BWF. And um, we are growing every week. We, are, we have uh, almost 200 likes every week on Facebook, uh, 100 new followers every week on Twitter, and 200 new followers every week on Instagram. Um, so we are slowly, steady building up a big fan base. I think also, Emma, it's fair to point out, you know, when did Babington Europe start, first start to get into social media? I think it was maybe Brian and, and Jimmy would confirm it was around 2009, 2010. Would that be correct? And uh, I, it was a big jump at that point uh, because it was still relatively young uh, at that point in time. And uh, certainly with Facebook and Twitter, uh, uh, Babington Europe has not just reaching uh, to Europe, it's reaching globally uh, to many, many fans around the world. And uh, more recently with Instagram, uh, we can see a huge rise in the use of Instagram uh, across uh, uh, f with Babington fans globally. Um, they all have their specific uses and their specific needs, and, uh, but certainly... Uh, you know, Babington Europe, as you can see from the figures on the left, uh, you know, there's a lot of work gone into it, and it takes a lot of work, but you can see the work is starting to pay off with the number of users and the number of uh, interactions we're getting uh, every week. Yes. Um, to show you an example of how many people we can actually reach, I have one of our best Facebook posts. This is a video that reached almost 60,000 people. Um, in our experience, it is the videos that is the most uh, popular uh, because they will move on the screen when you scroll through the Facebook and that's what people notice. Um, this is something new that we tried during uh, the mixed team championships in Poland where we produced our own rallies of the day videos and this one was very popular. On Twitter, I have an example from last week where we, and it was announced that uh, Basel will be hosting the uh, World Championships in 2019. And we got eight, almost 19,000 impressions. And that's what Twitter is really uh, good, uh, is for the small and short announcements like this to get the information out quickly and make, to make it circulate. Oui. And this is our by far best Instagram post. Um, of course, this is also a very special post because this is when Victor Axelsen got his uh, bronze medal. And yes, Jimmy, you are the one who took that picture and sent it to me. Um, and this is an, is an example of that it's not only uh, the pictures from uh, court or from the tournaments, but people like to see what's going on backstage and what they cannot see when watching it on TV. Um, normally, when we post something, and Victor is a very popular player for us to use, we will get 800 likes. So this is, this is a very special one. So thank you, Jimmy. And... During the Euro mixed teams championships in Poland, we went all out <laughs> and uh, we had live streaming uh, via um, laola1tv.com, I think it's called. Um, we made graphics uh, that promoted the live streams um, and we sent it out to promote the live stream before every tie. Mark wrote daily articles for the website, which was posted on Twitter and Facebook. Also, he posted a daily photo album um, on Facebook and a montage on Twitter. And he did live interviews as, as well um, from 
his phone uh, live on Facebook. Um, and then I did a lot of uh, short movies with my phone, um, where it's um, sorry. I did a, a lot of small movies. An example could be where you film the last match point in a match. Uh, it's not the best quality, it's not the best camera, but with a phone it can work and you can post it right away. And um, that was also very popular for us. And on Instagram, before you post it, you can push uh, a button so it also posts directly to Facebook and Twitter, the exact same post. And that helps um, help me a lot, so that I don't have to go and post it, sim uh, the same post a lot of times, but I can do it with just one click. And of course, there is the new Instagram story, that Instagram, a new feature that they have, where the more informal content will go on. I am also using, only using this for big events. I'm also using it uh, today, and we'll use it tomorrow. And of course, our rallies of the day videos that I talked to you about earlier um, was also a brand new thing that we did and we posted a video daily, both on Facebook and YouTube. <coughs> Here's an example of some of the graphics on Instagram and Twitter. And here we have the numbers from the competition where we reached a lot of people. It was very, very, very positive for us. This is from Facebook, and this is from Twitter. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the tools that I'm using to make a social media strategy. And what you need, what I'm doing to, have a, to make a strategy is first of all, I need to know who my followers are where they're from and what language they speak. And then I'm using scheduling tools to plan and schedule posts. And then I have a common thread that, um, so that I have a common thread, which means that I have used the same hashtags and used the same picture and used the same words uh, throughout all of the so different social medias. Oh my God, yes. And here we have, yes, this is on Facebook. If you go on to insights and then down to people on the left, you will get um, an idea of who your fans are. And as you can see, our fans are mainly male, 18 to 24 years old from Malaysia or Kuala Lumpur and English speaking which is a little bit surprising, but apparently Asia is crazy about badminton Europe online. Um, this is our fans, this is our followers. This is who we reach. So this is not only who are following us, but who we actually reach. And here you can see on the city that we are reaching a lot of local people from Copenhagen, uh, even though that they don't like our page. And we have also France as the top country there. This is important information to give you an idea of who is your audience, who is it that is reading and getting this content that you're publishing. One of the tools that I'm using is Hootsuite. It's free, you have to sign up online. And um, this one can connect to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And this is an example of some of the streams that you can create, this is the front page um, here I uh, can uh, monitor who is using, here on the right you see who is using the BEC50 hashtag, who is our, my, our new followers, who is mentioning us, Badminton Europe, BEC, and the last one is our tweets. Um, if I want to schedule a post, I click 
on the top, and I can write a text, and I can put a date and a time, specific time, and add, uh, choose which social media I want it to be scheduled to, and then schedule it. And like this, you can have uh, this website posting your social media posts without you being there to do it, like without doing anything. So I can, this is what I have scheduled for this weekend to promote the live stream. And I did this last, well, this week, early this week. And now I have, I don't have to take care of that anymore. This will just post automatically. It's very useful and very helpful. Another tool for that is Buffer. It's basically the same. Here you can see that I have scheduled um, schedule of the day from our circuit tournament in France and from the Super Series tournament in India. So whenever there's a tournament coming, I set it up and schedule it, and then I don't have to think about it and go back. This, then it's all covered. Um, this is also free. Uh, you have to sign up. So that's also a very good one. Then there's this one, later.com, also free. Uh, I only use it for Instagram. Um, and the thing about most of the scheduling tools for the Instagram pro is that uh, it will not be posting it completely automatically. It will um, send you a notification on your phone at the scheduled time where you will have to actively agree and allow it to post it. So Instagram is a bit more tricky, but with Twitter and Facebook, it works very well. Also, Facebook has some publishing tools I just uh, started using, and I actually really like it. Um, also, where you can go to publishing tools and schedule and have drafts and have an overview of what you have scheduled and what you've already posted. Um, it works very well. And this one is a lot easier to use when, if you want to uh, schedule it on your phone. The three other examples I showed you are easiest on a computer. Um, so this one is very handy. And now I want to give you an example of the common thread that I was talking about. As you can see, this is the same news story published on three different social media. Uh, I'm using the same picture, and I'm using the same hashtags, and the, obviously the same headline. That's um, my picture this time, Jimmy. Yeah. I also credit you on the picture. Um, a good uh, reason to do this is also to get the fan to recognize the news. Uh, on all different social medias, um, uh, so we can have the fans follow us on all of them. <laughs> now the hashtags. Today we are, this weekend we're using BEC50 and I want to encourage all of you to use this hashtag. Um, so that we can have a lot of content from this weekend and I will go in here and find something because hopefully all of you will post a picture and I will repost it on our social media so we can promote what a lovely time we had this weekend. So I hope that you will all join us and help us celebrate our 50th anniversary online. Yes. Okay, thank you, Emma. Um, in my introduction earlier, I forgot to mention, first and foremost, I'm a photographer, and uh, behind the camera is where you'll find me. I tend to shy away from the other side of the lens for these reasons. Uh, but, yeah, um, over, I think about 18 months ago, uh, I spoke to Jimmy, and I, I think I spoke to Brian about the need for us to come up with some kind of way of uh, organizing and... Uh, putting together in a historic database all the photographs that we have been starting to gather over the years. I know Joao, you know, has, has been very active in the past, and uh, I know putting this book together, trying to go back, where is he? 
trying to go back and find photographs uh, from ages ago and looking at negatives and uh, it's been a headache for you. And uh, this is the reason why about 18 months ago I, I spoke to Jimmy about putting together a really proper database of all the photographs I shoot when I'm either on the circuit or whether I am at a, uh, a major uh, Babington Europe event, be it a European Juniors or be it the, you know, the, the, the European Championships. So with that in mind, uh, I'm very fortunate to have my good friend Raphael uh, in Babington Photo. Uh, we go back a long time together, and I, I asked him uh, you know, what way he did it, and they have, and I, Babington England will be familiar with it, Babington Denmark will be familiar with it, and uh, a few more will be familiar with the database that uh, Babington Photo use, and we have ex essentially copied it. Yeah, why, why change something that, that works? So it's a... It's an uh, open source database that's online, but it's been there many, many years and it's grown over the years and it's a platform called PWIGO. And uh, it essentially allows you upload photos or whatever it may be, whatever your area of expertise, whether it's video or whatever, and create a database online and uh, build up this historical record moving forward. So I started... I think it was uh, 2015, autumn time, and uh, started to build the database. There was a lot of work to build it behind and uh, format it and get it ready. And then I started to add, the first tournament I added was, uh, retrospectively, I added all the photos from the Baku Games in 2015. But since uh, January 2016, we've been adding all the circuit tournaments. So the first tournament we would have added live would have been the Swedish uh, masters at the time, I think, PG, yeah? So, in that one year, uh, you can see the first figure up on top. Uh, we've now 15,000 photos in the, in the database. And that, those photos are of as many players I can shoot uh, as an individual at an event. So, it'll cover players across all member associations, from the smallest up to the biggest. Uh, sometimes uh, with, with the bigger organizations, they have big clients that they have to, uh, to manage and provide for, and then they forget about some other uh, you know, players that may, or may, may be playing. We try and cover everyone. And right now, we travel, I think, maybe around to six, eight circuit events per year, and then all the major tournament, the major championships. And what we do is effectively go and we shoot photos. And then there's a system behind it where I have uh, an online uh, uh, system where I can manage the photos, rename them, tag them with players' names. I have a system uh, in my photo uh, processing software where I can now recognize faces. So as the database gets bigger, the uh, photo recognition becomes more intelligent over time, which means that if I shoot a photo of Emma Mason playing down in the, the backyard there somewhere, it'll recognize her face from a previous shot and automatically tag it so I don't actually have to physically tag that one anymore. So it grows in intelligence as we get more photos. We have individual galleries from every event. So let's say, for example, uh, we have a player. Let's say uh, a Turkish player has been playing very well at a particular tournament. And uh, we want to find that picture from a semi-final uh, that the Turkish girl or boy has won. Each gallery uh, per tournament is then broken down into individual days. So you can break it down to an individual day. Oh, yeah, there's the photo. Uh, and go in and take it. And then the hard part for me, because I'm, I'm pretty much solo on this, is not just shooting the photos, but it's also um, getting them up online and getting them up quickly. But in generally, at a tournament, I will upload maybe two to three times per day. So if there's a morning session, you will generally, within an hour, have uh, 100, 200, 300 photographs up there online, ready to be used, all in high resolution, all without a watermark. And the good thing about this, and we started it at the European Mixed Team Championships, is where we invited all the members, member associations, to use that database. So that database is now there. Uh, and I think the way we're going to use it moving forward is when we have a major championship, obviously you can get a username and a login. 
uh, not to be abused. If it, be, if, if, if it starts to be abused, you know, we can certainly curtail that and pull it back. But if somebody from uh, Moldova is playing in uh, a European Championships and gets a good win, and I have a photograph, you at that European Championships will have a login to be able to come in and find that photo, take it down and use it on your social media platforms to promote it, to talk about it, to get the news out there, and we'll even allow you in that case to send it to your national media in high resolution that they might create some buzz about it, okay? So this, this, uh, this resource is now available, and of course, every tournament we, grow to, we go to, it's, it's, getting, uh, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. I also travel to circuit events, and for example, the first one I did this year was in Estonia, in, in, in Tallinn, beautiful tournament, beautiful little tournament, immaculately run, and excellent to photograph. And while I'm at those tournaments, any circuit tournaments I travel to, the member association, by default, will have access to those th those, that database of tournaments, of, of photos. So, if I go to Germany, to a, a tournament, if I go wherever it may be, Scotland, England, Turkey, Belgium, wherever it may be, when I'm there, the member association will have an access and be able to use our photographs uh, from, that, from that tournament. You won't have indefinite use, because we really have to protect the resource, but at the same time, it has, you know, it, it'll be there to be used. And uh, we certainly saw a badminton Denmark use a lot of our photos from uh, the European Mixed Team Championships and a couple of other member associations also. So the next tournament I will be at will be uh, Helsinki. I'll be up in Helsinki next week. So Mika, I'll be there at your tournament and. Uh, you will have a login and a password to our database. You probably have a photographer on site anyway. Some do, some don't. But the option is there to take a photo and use it for uh, your media purposes. Um, I think we're going to go on and uh, Sophia is actually going to bring up the back end of the database online so you can actually just see it very quickly how it works. So if just bear with us for one second. So we're, we're effectively just going directly to the internet to pull this up and uh, just give you a, a, a brief view of the database. So there you go, there you can see it. Can we take down these lights, Hugo? A little bit, uh, maybe. Um, when you go back, you saw the front end and it's all down the left-hand side, you can see the list of the tournaments I've been at over the last, how long? And this is just a graphical gallery of each on the right-hand side. So I've, I've been to the European Para Championships and places like that. So if we go back to the top on the left-hand side, we'll use the European Mixed Team Championships as an example because we've been speaking a lot about that. You can already see on the top left-hand corner, I've already started to add photos from here. So that's the kind of speed I'm trying to get, uh, to get these photos up in. But again... The European uh, Mixed Team Championships, uh, all broken down in today's. Uh, Vaka played his farewell exhibition. I had a separate gallery for that, which would have been of interest to the Polish Badminton Federation to say something about. All, if you, double, if you just click into any one, say day four semi-finals, you can see it there, or quarter-finals, any of them at all, Sophia. Uh, all the photographs will be there, and you can see they're all named. And those names and tags, they're active. In other words, if you go in there and you want to find Matthias Bo or you want to find Joshua or whatever like that, you just type his name or a portion of his name and it will pop up. So it just makes the tedious task of trying to find a photo that you want when you're trying to get something out there quick and you want to find a photo quickly. Uh, all the hard work has been done in the background to, uh, to tag, not only to rename, but to also tag the photos. So we might, just as an example, Sophia, pick a player. What player are you going to pick? Just shout it out. Anyone pick a player? Nana Vainio. Plenty of Nana. <laughs> so even if you just probably type in Nana, you'll get all the Nanas if there are many. But if you type in Nana Vainio, all of a sudden, anything with Nana pops up. 
Okay? So, as a member association, if we're in Finland next week and there's a, uh, one of your players is playing Mika and you need a photo, something good goes down, get in here, take the photo, take it down and use it. That's, uh, that's, that's the message. Uh, we'll, the, the, on the right hand side, you can uh, up along top, the download button is just up there on the right hand side. You're downloading in high resolution. Most other off providers offer you in uh, low resolution you know, to protect their interests. What are we doing here? We're trying to get, uh, we're trying to get Babington out there. Yep. So we're quite happy if we get to a situation where Nana is in the final of the European Championships and Babington Finland need a, a photo to, to, to broadcast that in high resolution to send to the media or whatever. Or if Emma and Nana team up in women's doubles or something like that, yeah? That'd be fun, I'd photograph that. So that is, uh, well, that, that's essentially how the database works. It's extremely quick. You go in, you log in with a username and password, you type in the name of the player, you click download, and it's in your downloads folder, and you go and use it. Uh, and, and that is essentially it. Anything else on the, on the database? The, the key for us is, you know, we want to promote it. We want people to use these photographs. Uh, but at the same time, we're going to be very, very, very careful about uh, looking after the, da the database. I don't, you know, we certainly don't want to see uh, Jean-Marc take a photograph and use it in France, but then, and then two weeks' time it appears in uh, the Irish national papers for some reason. You know, we have, to, we have to be wary that this is a very important resource that we also have to look after. And, uh, but amongst ourselves, when we're using it as MAs, let's use it where, where, the, where the rules allow it. And that is essentially it. So hopefully this, this time next year, I'll, there'll be in excess of 40,000 photos there um, for, every, for everyone to use. And not only that, yeah, we also have the historical ones from last year's ADM and this year. So when, you, so when 75 years comes around and you want to make a book, uh, it's a lot easier to do. And again, why are we talking about this database? We're talking about it in connection with social media. Yeah, it, social media is a visual thing, and, and Emma has already spoken about the video, and video is hugely important. Uh, also, photographs are hugely important as, as a, a, an historical record, but also for you to, you to, to have this added value when you make a social media post, something that's in the now or something that reflects the post that you're doing with a visual that'll make that uh, end user, that uh, person that's interacting with you online, make you click. Make them click and read and learn and you know, get involved a little bit more with badminton. So that's the database. Um, it's very, very simple. It works uh, even for myself. You know, uh, when I'm writing articles for Babington Europe, rather than have to go back through my own records, I, I just jump into the database and find the photo I need very quick for an article and things like that. Uh, very, very, very useful. It saves an awful lot of time. Looking good there, Nana? Yeah? Which is your favorite? <laughs> Thank you, Sophia. Uh, and that's... That is... You, anything else? Emma, that's it? Everyone has asked, is there any questions? And all the uh, speakers have gone before. I'm, I'm going to reverse that a little bit, and I'm going to ask some questions. Uh, you know, certainly the World Championships are coming up, and we see how active Scotland are with their social media campaigns, and it's been phenomenal for about a year and a half. I think the most, you must have all sold all the tickets by now, Anne. Yeah? <laughs> Same with England in and around the old Englands, uh, the social media campaigns that England run, and... Uh, and, and utilize, you know, are always very informative, but as far as the other member associations go, do you think that you utilize social media enough? That would be a question I would ask you. Is anyone willing to answer that? Anyone willing to, you know, put their hand up and go, well, maybe we should do a little bit more, or what can we do to do more? Anyone think... Oh, social media, why do we even need it? Why do we bother? Is there people in, the, in, in here in this room that would think that? No, nobody, nobody willing to commit. Emma's going to say something. 
Thank you. Obviously, I'm not working in a member association, but I think in response to your question, do we do enough? No, I don't think so. Um, and I think from my perspective as an individual, when I'm, you know, trying to republish things that Emma's perhaps sent me or, or you know, publicise anything about Bampton Europe, it does sometimes come down to a knowledge base, which obviously you've talked a little bit about there, but also a, a time management thing, because, you know, it takes time to... I'm not funny, so it takes a long time to write a funny post or to, you know, put up something that um, other people might want to engage with. So, again, answering your question, no, I don't think we do enough and I think we can do more, but probably a question I'd have for the two of you is, what can the member associations do to be more efficient with their social media? Because it's, you know, sitting here, I grew up in, a, in an age where, you know, I, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, that's, that's the normal, that's what I grew up with, but it's not necessarily that easy and it does take a lot of time out of somebody's day job. So resources think, is a big thing. Yeah. yeah? And a lot of the member associations would have limited resources. Yeah, we, we certainly understand that. But certainly, say, for example, with the European Mixed Team Championships that we've uh, highlighted, uh, you know, Emma put together the graphic, you know, of, of all the matches with the nice, you know, a lot of work goes into those graphics. But I'm, I would certainly be conservative in saying that there was not many member associations that would have even just retweeted that their... Uh, team was playing in a match against whoever it was. Uh, it is. It, it takes a lot of uh, human resources. But when, when we talk about social media, you know, uh, outside of a tournament or outside of a big event, what do you need to do? Maybe one post a week if you're a small member association. It's time. It's about time management. It's about getting yourself familiar with it. We're trying to make the tools available. You have all these scheduling tools that you can now. I remember. You know, starting with Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and doing each one, at, you know, individually at a time. And I started at lunchtime and almost finished it was time for dinner. Yeah. But those days are gone with these uh, little pieces of software that are free that you can schedule things. And, you know, we're in a world where we need to schedule things. So I think I think that argument is starting to dilute a little bit. Uh, I do absolutely agree that, you know, we have some member associations where maybe you have one person in an office and so on and so forth, but it's about really finding that half an hour or to make, you know, one post a week. It's about if I go to Finland next week and uh, I'm shooting at the uh, Finnish International in Vanta and there's a player from whichever small uh, member association there, and, they, and there's a folder there that they can use to create a little bit of hype about, because your top level player is as much as, is as important in your own home market as these guys winning uh, Thomas Cups on the global scene, yeah? And create a little bit of buzz about your top player, and it takes a lot of time, you know, when you start a social media account, and you see 50, you, you know, you have 50 followers and you're going, what's the point? Yeah? But you have to keep at it. And that's what Babington Europe have done. You know, they started off very small, but now we see the numbers that are following. And yes, there are a lot of Asian followers. But why? Because we'd often get messages on Babington Europe, you know, oh, I, we love Babington Europe because they are always involved in giving us loads of Babington information compared to other confederations. Have I waffled on a bit, Emma? Sorry. If, and I, both of you can answer this, but um, if we're to try and streamline the process and use one of these scheduling tools, because that's obviously going to help member associations be more efficient, which one would you recommend and why? Which one of the tools? Yeah, the scheduling tools. Um, yeah, I use all of them um, because they fit buffer I like for Twitter. Facebook's own publishing tools I like for Facebook, and later.com I like for Instagram. But Hootsuite, the first one I showed you, can do all three. So it is nice to have it all in one. Um, so that's what I would recommend. The other, the other, the other 
other thing I'll say is that uh, it, it takes a lot of, for example, again, at the European Mixed Team Championships, there was myself, there was Emma, there was Hugo, uh, my son was there helping out. As well. You know, it took a lot of effort for all that work. Uh, so maybe as a small member association, you maybe say, well, look, we're just going to use Facebook. You know, cut your cloth to the size that you need it. Uh, and we're going to really get a good Facebook presence and try and build on that and then go from there. Um, and then to answer, you know, to answer your question, you can just post directly on Facebook, uh, something like that. Um, just to answer your question, first you asked uh, if we use Facebook enough and social media enough as, yeah. as asso associations. Coming from one of the smallest, we're from Malta, and uh, we use um, social media quite a lot. Yeah. And we would like also to not only um, update our, our followers about local competitions and badminton Europe competitions, but also to get more people who are not yet involved in badminton and to start following actually as fans, as supporters. And, and I think that um, uh, coming also from um, um, my profession on, on, on marketing as well, um, I think w something that might help us to get even more interest, um, to get more interest to, to the general public basically, is to maybe um, uh, give more content that we can, actually not only the competitions and the, the things that are happening, because if someone is not following badminton and uh, we post about any, any, any competition that's going on. Maybe we cannot pick their interest, but if we say, um, uh, post a video about, um, I don't know. Like what? What do you want? Something, something um, um, uh, like, I don't know, interesting facts about shuttles, for example. How is a shuttle made up? How, yeah. Well, I why? do know, again, you know? we have- So we that we can, we can yeah. first get those people interested. Okay. Then we, we start getting more, more followers. And if all, all the associations do that, of course, badminton Europe as well, we'll get the results from that as well. Okay, points taken. I do know we have some interesting, funny videos coming after, you know, uh, that take a little bit of time to uh, process, Hugo. Um, you know, you know, little teasers and tidbits and little things like this with, you know, funny questions to players, not just the normal, what was the match like? you know, more interesting, uh, generic uh, short videos that everyone will then be able to repost and things like that. We're working on that, but again, on your point about, you know, those factual little uh, things like how many feathers on a shuttle, what's the fastest smash, all of these things. These are things that interest you. Yeah, okay. Richard. Oh. Go ahead, Martin. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, PV, I think it's a very good service uh, with the pictures. So my question is, is uh, the access just for the member associations? Or is, for example, also possible for the players? So my, my feeling is that sometimes associations are very slow in this, and, uh, and the athletes are very quick, so they, perhaps they can also use these pictures very well for them. Thorny subject, thorny subject, Martin. Uh, no disrespect to any player in the room, Nana. But we have a situation in, uh, within badminton where players feel they have the right to use anything at any time. And that, that's changing a bit, thanks to the Athletes Commission and their work. But there certainly, historically, has been uh, an abuse of the photos. People see a photo as part of a gallery with a watermark, and they feel that they can then take it uh, without uh, credit the photographer or the source, be it badminton Europe or whatever and just use it for themselves or then give it to a paper to use or whatever like that. Uh, so that's, that's, that's an ongoing discussion as a photographer or somebody who wants to protect my art, because that's what it is, uh, with badminton Europe, and that's for another day's discussion. But certainly, I would have no issue with, uh, and I'm sure Brian is the same, that you know, the players should be able to use these photos if they're used uh, in, in the right way, and if it's not abused. Brian, would you agree with what I just said? I'm not, you're not going to hit me in the back of the head? No, okay. Yeah. Richard.
Um, just the power of players in terms of social media from an MA's point of view. So, you know, basically being able to use the players as, um, as a, especially smaller to medium MA's that don't have the resource to, to basically be the, the front light. I think everybody likes to have a, a closer uh, communication and link to players. And I know in Ireland, where I was before, Scott Evans has been uh, great for the sport from mainstream media to uh, the badminton uh, populace. You know, he's a well-known character, and I think the characters are pretty essential for social media. Um, MEs can put out some really important information, but to go viral and to get uh, the, the numbers, you know, you need characters and you need sports stars. So I don't know if you can maybe <coughs> give a bit of a background of, of what you've seen works in that area. So, for example, some of the things we did before was to give some of our players access to the national Twitter. So they would um, kind of tweet for the MA for the week and give a behind the scenes um, kind of idea of training, the interaction and, and, and everything else. And I think it was really interesting for your average uh, badminton fan. I don't know if you've seen any yeah, any good I, I certainly, I certainly have seen a lot of the badminton brands handing over their Instagram account maybe to a player that's on, you know, at a Super Series event and things like that. And that, yeah, they do it. They've done it at all the majors, and that seems to be a hugely popular thing because you, you're you're starting to get behind the scenes, yeah, and you're you know you're starting to get interesting. Uh, uh, information coming from these tournaments, not just the same front of house uh, stuff that we would tend to see week in, week out. You made a very valid point, and I sort of touched on it earlier, Richard, that uh, you know, within your own individual member associations, you might think you're a small member association, but your top players are very important in that, in your member association, no matter what the le their level may be internationally. And you, if you can uh, use your top players and you know, try and educate them to start really using and seeing the value because, believe it or not, sponsors and brands, the f primarily sometimes, well, primarily the first question they will ask a player if they want to, uh, if, if some player comes to them for sponsorship, how active are you on social media? Most of the brands and sponsors nowadays have social media guidelines for players and potential partners. So it's hugely important. And, the, and as you point out, Richard, the member associations should really piggyback off that and use that to their own effect, to stuff that's relevant to you. To you. Yeah. Uh, Mark and Emma, I think I'm... In fact, I'm sure I speak for everyone in the room to say that you're doing a fantastic job. And that was a first class presentation. Will your slides be put up on the Badminton Europe website so we can have access to them? For sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm a bit mindful of the time. I think uh, time is running. And uh, there will be a chance to come back with more questions later. I think we said okay that we cut it here. Good, thanks for all your, your valid points, all your comments. Emma, are you taking over from here? Yeah. And thank you to, to Mark and, uh, and Emma. Very good. Yeah, thanks very much to Mark and Emma. I think it's a really great last topic because it's got you all talking a little bit. Um, so we're now going to do something a little bit different for the forum. We're going to go outside. There's um, some drinks and some refreshments. And what I'd like you to do for the next sort of 45 minutes before we come back in for the last Q&A is you have a drink, share some stories about today, talk to your colleagues about what you think worked, what you liked from what you heard today, if you have any other questions about some of the programs that were talked about, whether it's social media, power badminton, or the basis program, feel free to talk to the BEC staff, to the board of directors, feel free to talk amongst yourselves, but please come back ready to, to ask some questions, because um, the BEC staff are gonna, who are responsible for executing all the programs we've talked about today are gonna be up on stage to answer your questions. Thank you very much, and go and enjoy a drink, please. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, back in at 3.15.
ourselves.
mikrofon, er det godt? Bare kom op øh, foran, så der er ja. øh, Nu har du fået med den før. Den ligger den der er lige til Du ikke smadre mig. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for coming back in. I hope you all enjoyed the drinks and you had a, a good little chat with everybody who's around. Um, as I said, this is the last formal bit of the session, which is designed as a question and a wrap-up of everything you've heard today. There's been a lot of information shared, whether it's member structures, power badminton, the center of excellence. And I've got up here the, the BEC staff who are responsible for executing those programs and so who you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. They are here to listen to any feedback you might have on the, on the presentations that were made today. Feel free to comment on the format as well and uh, to share your opinions about what's worked, what's not worked. But also, as we've said a lot today, we very rarely get together as uh, 52 member associations. And so this is really our opportunity to, if you have any questions or queries that you want raised, this is the forum um, to do it in. And hopefully we can have an open discussion amongst friends. So can I kick this off and ask if the floor has any immediate questions for any of the BEC staff? Can I have Adrian? Thank you. Uh, it's not a question, uh, but more a just a comment, really, and uh, maybe a suggestion. Uh, firstly, thank you all very much for a very informative day. Um, if I may, without being too unkind, uh, much better than last year. So well done to you all on, on that. Um, I would, though, maybe like to put a suggestion in that we find more time to discuss some of the topics as smaller groups. It is quite difficult in such a, with such a huge audience here to, to really get into some debate, and particularly um, you know, when maybe some issues are more important and more challenging to some nations than they may be to others. So maybe some, I, I don't want to be, uh, maybe a bit just sizing some of us or understanding some of the challenges that we have at different, different stages and of, our, of, our, uh, of our evolutions might be quite important. So just, just a suggestion for next year, but, but great job today, and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Adrian, for the comment. Jimmy, can I ask you to sort of comment on the, on the format we put together? Because I think breakout, se breakout sessions is really what you're talking about, smaller groups, and perhaps maybe we can do that next year. Uh, no, as, as Emma said, we are always uh, all yes to, to new suggestions, new formats. What, what we tried this year was to actually want to be more interactive. Uh, I just briefly spoke to, to Derek outside, and I, I agree with the comment saying, 
that the setup of tables might have been uh, useful doing a little bit different so you don't just need to sit and watch uh, each other in the back of the head but being more interactive in small groups as well that could maybe become handy in, in putting the table uh, set up d differently uh, but Adrian if I can ask you just a small favor put uh, put it in one two lines uh, back home to us so so we really have some 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 good input that we can work with Go going forward it is is saying that now it's now it's it's words but if you can have it put in writing we we really want to evaluate uh, on this how we did uh, how how you want us us to do we we are here for you guys we we brought forward what we feel felt necessary to to feed you guys with of information but if you feel the need of having other kind of information and specifically in a different way uh, or maybe even in uh, in smaller groups as you say we are definitely all ears and we want to do this for you Is there any other questions on the floor? Thank you. I will not come up to you. <laughs> I will stay here. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, René Toft. I'm president of Badminton Denmark. I have been asking Brian Ayer back about where do I put those comments and those questions I have. Then I have been told now. And therefore I'm staying here now. Because I was very much in doubt about doing it now. What do the staff has to do with, with my question, with my comments? A little a little, the politician much more, I think. Because a lot of question has to be uh, answered by politician, also in our organization. Um, in 1900, we are back in the last uh, decade, 1907, Seventy. Uh, suddenly, there was a uh, comments from Cosmos from Apollo 13. Houston, we have a problem. Why that? From me, because now we are saying 2017, and. Um, Badminton Europe, we maybe have a problem. Apollo 13, they couldn't do anything where other what they have done, getting uh, it back to Earth, saving the free uh, astronauts. Maybe we can do something before the great accident has reached to Badminton Europe, among others, Badminton Europe. And I'm, I'm saying that because of, um, I am not sure it's a good thing who has happened with a new structure, with tournaments all over Badminton World Federation. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe we will first see it in three, four, five years, because it's what is going to happen about our tournaments, international tournaments, uh, from 18 to 21. And when I'm saying that, I, I have to uh, say to you, we, we had made an offer to Badminton World Federation. We, we think it was a fantastic offer, um, maybe one of the best. We wanted to go up on level, on level two, but we didn't get it. We had it combined with a tournament on level five, Grand Prix Gold tournament. We didn't get it. And when I'm looking on where are, where are the tournament uh, taking place, from 18 
to 21. We have no more tournaments in Europe. And the German has been taken one of their, their two, and Spain, congratulations with that, have uh, got uh, that one. But we have not more tournaments in Europe. And I think we should have. Because of the new system, that will be very difficult for Europe's talent players to get up in the world ranking. When when they uh, wish to go up in that, they have to be, they have to be, uh, be really good players, I know. But now, as I look upon it, we have to send much more players out to Asia to get points, to make uh, uh, getting up on the world rank. They have to go out to the tournaments in Asia. And we, know, we all know it's very difficult to win tournaments out there and to get good points to the world ranking. And I can only say we really wish to have one tournament more in Denmark and we should have much more in all in Europe because I see really problems coming up and we, we won't see it in the next year because at the 17 is playing after the, the old rules, the old structure, uh, with challenge uh, in, uh, in front of every Super Series uh, tournament and Super Series Premier tournaments. So we won't see it before. Maybe it's too late. And therefore, I'm only asking, what are we going to do? I know it has been European sitting in the council saying, yes, 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 yes. And then I can see six, six Asian countries having two tournaments. Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Thailand, Korea. And when you, wh China, you, China, 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 China. When the wildlife has a small break and you are finding number six, I think we, we have to move on to, um, to uh, you know, the, the, the point. Uh, and if there's something that we can answer, that would be, we'll try to do our best. Um, just because we, 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 have to, we have to just move on the agenda. So can you, what, what, is the, what is the key question that you want to ask? Um, what are the key message that you, you want to just, send? You have just done my question. Okay. But I'm sorry. Because we have no other way. Because that's making contracts for the period 18 to 21 now. And we only have that possibility. But we have to be much more concentrate on what we are going to do in Europe. We are the one continent who is up against Asia. We have to say that there's not coming players who can win medals at uh, Olympic Games and World Championships w uh, without Asians and Europeans. And I hope a lot of Europeans, and especially it would be very good if it's Danes. So we, 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 we have to take care about that. And I, I really hope that our council, BWF council members from Europe, have been looking at the, on this problem and not first now. I, I really hope. They have done it, because we have to take care of that. And what uh, Brian is saying, yes, let us go out in the next four years making a lot of challenge, uh, no, level, 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 six, six. level six tournaments. We have to do it for our players to come forward on the world rank, and I hope it's not only Denmark who is going to do this. I hope uh, a lot of other uh, countries will do it. And uh, we hope still we can do it together with you, as we ha had uh, the wish to do uh, with the Grand Prix Gold Tournament, which we didn't get. But that was all for now. And then you have not to listen to me tomorrow in this issue. Thank you.
Hello. Oh. Hello, I'm Smiley, Bampton, Scotland. Um, thank you uh, for that. But can I take this opportunity to, to say how delighted I am uh, to hear that uh, Bampton, Switzerland has been awarded the 2019 World Championships, which will be two years after Scotland uh, will have staged this prestigious event the crown jewel in the BWF's calendar. And I congratulate the um, European members on the uh, World Council uh, for doing what they did that resulted in an overwhelming majority for this event to be held once again in uh, Europe. So um, I do take on board what you say, uh, but we must be mindful that Europe, Europe v Asia, we still struggle uh, with regard to funding, sponsorship, and the like. So, but be rest assured that the um, European Council members on BWF, I'm confident, are doing what they can for Bampton Europe. And then, I, I'm not going to give Rene the answer that he needs, eh, because for the answer that he needs, we will have to spend a bit of time to talk him through the whole process. But, but I just want to reassure you that we have critically looked at this. We have pushed for it, and you know that we've partnered uh, together with you to get that, uh, that Grand Prix Gold in. We were also disappointed that we couldn't get to the result, especially on the Grand Prix Gold, because we feel that, that we're missing out on a couple uh, of, of that level tournaments in Europe. Uh, I think overall we're not very satisfied with the result, but We've also talked to the people that have taken the decision. We've pushed uh, uh, those people also to, uh, to explain to us why that decision was taken. And when going through the reasoning, I see where they're coming from. Um, that's not a good result yet for Europe, and I think we have to create a climate in which we are uh, in four years in a position that we can reclaim uh, a couple of those tournaments at that level. I think we still have the level six tournaments to look at uh, a bit as well in the whole. Uh, picture and obviously the tournaments below, but they are not going to help some of our more uh, talented, uh, talented Danish players. So I, I very much acknowledge that there is an issue. Um, we will, I, and we can sit down together with Peter, uh, who is, is on our board in Europe, but is also the chair of events at uh, BWF, to really talk you through the whole decision-making progress, why we came to the conclusion that we came to. Um, but I can reassure you that I've uh, at least uh, raised uh, the issue, that also the officers raised the issue several times. I can show you lots of correspondence on that. So we are not losing sight of this. It's not uh, an ideal position, and, and we will, together with you, uh, hope to have a, a better result in the next, uh, the next time around. But we, we can take you through the, the whole process, but, but there is a reasoning behind it. So. Okay. Yes. Um, first of all, um, I wish to take the opportunity to inform you a little bit more. Thank you very much, Anne, for uh, addressing uh, the information around the World Championships. I think what will be unique for the first time is, though, that we're going to try to go also for the bit on para badminton. And for the first time in the history, we hope to get, obviously, once para badminton will be awarded, and this we still have to go through the process, within one and the same dates, the same venue, we will have the Badminton World Championships and Para Badminton World Championships at the same time, same venue, same town, uh, for the first time in history. There is no other sport who did ever do that. Normally it was always after a World Championships or, or soon after something that Para Badminton or a Para sport took place, but this is the first time that we're going to do it together in the same uh, venue. So maybe uh, we're always uh, looking forward then to to, to get your support and to also talk to your para badminton council uh, at home, uh, to your people to basically support also our bid, which will take place, uh, where we have to bid in until August 2017, where after the decision has to be taken. I just want to complete that information. Uh, it will not just be the World Championships, but even we hope the para badmintons at the same time. That's the bid that we gave in to BWF for the World Championship. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thomas? Hello, everybody. My name is Tommy Theorin, and I'm uh, newly president of Badminton Sweden. Uh, I agree. If we should have success, we have to keep together in Europe. I have worked in football 
for, as a general secretary for the Swedish League in 20 years, in near contact with uh, Leonard Johansson, Lars Christ Olsson, the other one at UEFA. Haven't Europe not stand together and keep those tournaments, uh, develop this tournament, Champions League, Europe League? We have been second or third on the world ranking. But these tournaments are so big. So what we, I think we have to do is stay together, keep together, and study what can we do together with tournaments, it, not in uh, teams, but, but in countries and individual, individual uh, tournaments. We have to, to learn from this and make what shall we do. Yes, we shall start studying this and then go on and keep together. Thank you. Does anybody have any follow-up comments? Jimmy? Does anyone, sorry, does anyone else have any questions for any of the BEC staff members? Maybe just one follow-up. Um, I think that it's quite right that uh, when it out now, it's, it's, I mean, we cannot do much for 18 to 21. Those, that decision is taken. The opportunity is still there to apply for level six tournaments. I think you, know, you wanted to make that point as well. So it's, it's important for us to have level six tournaments in Europe that our players can play. It's important for us to have challenge tournaments. Uh, and, I, and I think even if we have you know, a, a good number of that level of tournaments, we can still support our, our best players uh, so they don't have to travel all the time to Asia and they can actually gain enough points for Olympic qualification and other things. So, so encouragement from here to look at the feasibility of organizing at, at least le some level six tournaments, but also uh, challenge tournaments. Thanks, Brian. I think if there's no more questions, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. And, and just before I do, oh, sorry, Michael. Uh, Michael from Ireland. I would just like to ask, I know we talked about the club, European club championships early, earlier. Just want to make the point that have you thought of a Masters European team event? You do have, would, or we do have the European individual event, but a team event strikes me as quite a good way to increase participation in the individual events, both in Europe and at home. And have you had any thoughts on that? No. No, not so far. No. What, what we have been, uh, we have been approached by uh, a group of countries which have been organising something called Nations Cup. Among uh, when you say masters, we're talking uh, senior players plus 35 or plus 40, right? Uh, we have been approached by some countries that are organising Nations Cup, but but uh, so far it's not something that we have been uh, uh, starting any kind of engagement with. Of course, as, as it was mentioned in my presentation regarding European Club Championships, uh, as it is right now, there's not much much more space on our events program, uh, time-wise and, and capability-wise, uh, capacity-wise, not capabilities, capacity-wise. Uh, but again, if we are to cancel the European Club Championships at one stage, it could be an opportunity looking at a Masters Club Championships. Uh, if we need to look at certain age groups, uh, and again, if we're talking about European Championships, we c it cannot just be a small group of, of, uh, of countries. We need to open up widely. And, and what we have seen locally from many of our, our events over the past years is that uh, the participation is increasing to tremendously, that being both on, on junior level but also on elite level. So uh, w once and if we open up for, for such an event, we have to make sure that we can cater for the uh, for the need that that such an event uh, uh, will need, but uh, but thank you very much for the comment, and it's definitely something that we have not thought of, and it is something that uh, might have a potential. Adrian, I'd just like to support that request from Michael. Actually, um, I think Ma <coughs> excuse me, I think Masters Babington is. Uh, is certainly growing. We, we're, we're experiencing a huge growth um, in England. Uh, I think also for event organisers, uh, from a financial point of view, the Masters, they, they do pay. Um, the, the events are brilliantly run. They're great fun um, in so many ways. Um, so I, I, I would really support what Michael's just asked for. I, I would like um, the, the Events Commission to, to take a serious look at the possibility of... Uh, of having a European Masters event, not a club championships, Jimmy. I'm not sure that was what 
Michael was asking for, but a, um, an international event or a European level event. I, I understood it like a, like, like a team competition between countries. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, but, but now when, when we are touching uh, veteran badminton or senior badminton, uh, it is, as you have seen, part, part of a suggested rule change tomorrow. Uh, and, and let, by all means, have a good discussion. If you have further, any further questions about that on tomorrow's agenda, it is an issue that is uh, an, an area where we, we see an enormous increase in the participation. And that also going to, again, put a lot of uh, stress and work on, an, on a potential organizer. And that's also why we, uh, we suggest making a kickback to the organizer financially, because it is, it is a big event to organize. And that's why we, we know it's, it's increasing, thereby the workload is also increasing. And thereby we suggest that uh, some financial kickback is also going back to the organizers. And I guess that could also be a, a possibility should we introduce a, a team event for, for that age group as well. Derek Batchelor of Babington, England. Um, I, I've talked to both Emma and, uh, and Jimmy about the possibility of maybe looking at the format of this event, this forum. Um, one was the idea of actually moving, uh, as I said to Jimmy, um, perhaps into round tables so you actually get a chance to discuss things. But the other one I discussed with Emma briefly was perhaps having workshops where you could actually take two out of three. So if you weren't interested in a particular subject, you just opted out of that one and did the other two. So you can actually really focus on the things you are particularly interested in and can share knowledge with others. So it's just really talking about format rather than anything else. The content's fine. It's the format I think we need to look at again, perhaps. Thanks. So I think, you know, from mine and Jimmy's perspective, we've, got a, we've had a lot of good feedback from you all on today on, on what's worked and also on what's not worked. And certainly we'll take it away for next year and, and, uh, and hopefully come back with some revamped ideas for you all. Um, I think, unless, I think we're done on questions. So I'm going to hand over to Brian for some housekeeping before I do the final wrap-up. For tonight, there's a, there's a delegate um, dinner, and the transport is leaving at 5.30. So just make sure you don't miss that. It's, uh, there's a bus uh, taking you to, uh, to a boat. So we'll be, uh, you'll be on a boat tonight with a buffet style um, dinner and drink, so I hope you enjoy that. Make sure you don't miss the bus. Hmm? Then I've been told to inform you all that the slides are already put on the website from, uh, from today's session, so you can find that on the Badminton Europe uh, page under, under the ADM. There's also some uh, slides around the form. Registration starts tomorrow at 9 o'clock, and uh, we'll use the same meeting room here for the ADM tomorrow. Thanks, Brian. I think... Just <laughs> and just regarding uh, the presentation that was made on, on, around the basis, our new uh, MA support program, uh, you have not yet seen any kind of application form that is a work in progress. We really wanted to have your input here to see uh, if, if you felt it was completely hopeless and there was ab absolutely no need for us to start working in, a, in an application process. But the uh, application form, the application process will be done as soon as possible after this, uh, this session. And by all means, if you don't feel you have uh, got, your, got the answers to your questions already during the presentations, this is a new initiative, not only for us, but especially for you guys. So if, if you feel that you need more information before sending in any kind of application, please come forward because this is something that we want to do for you. And uh, we do hope that you will get uh, everything out of it that, uh, that you wish to have. Okay, I think this is definitely it, and then I'm going to stop talking. I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much for all turning up here today. As I think everybody said at the start, it's great to see so many people here, to see old friends, new faces. Um, and I think we've had, or we certainly feel like we've had a very productive day. I'd also like to see this opportunity to say thanks to Brian, Jimmy, your own, Sophia, Tanya, and Emma, um, because there's a lot of hard work that goes into the forum today that... I certainly don't see 
half of it, and I'm sure you guys today don't realize how much has gone in. So I'd just like to say, can we put our hands together and say thanks very much to the BAC staff. And then I'd just like to, if you guys want to, Gregory, can I invite you up on stage to close the forum, please? Thanks, guys. I, I thought she was doing that for me, actually, but uh, not now. Everything that I was supposed to say, I think, was already mentioned. Uh, I, I wanted to go to over a couple of practicalities. Um, but I think as, as a conclusion from today, I hope you see the willingness of our office to help you uh, enjoy the many programs that we have. So um, please do not hesitate to reach out. We're not an organization where you file an application and we will not help you uh, do that. Uh, we're um, an office that's there for you and to help you uh, and even uh, to clarify some of the programs that we have up front. So please do that. Take that opportunity. Um, we'll uh, also happily take all of the feedback that we got and, and also around some of the tournament structures back. It's that kind of feedback that can be given to us at any moment informally and formally and I'm happy that, uh, that Rene, for example, took that up. But do approach our organization as an organization where those kind of comments are always taken in a constructive way and we will seek to represent you in the best way possible uh, at each of the levels. So I'm very happy that we had that conversation. I uh, just want to echo a couple of the messages. Very uh, happy with Switzerland. Looking forward to a couple of presentations tomorrow uh, about events that will happen this year uh, in Europe and, and not in the least the World Championships in, uh, in Scotland. So I hope this has been informative for you. Uh, I hope you met a couple new people as well, at least I have. Uh, and congratulations to the many new presidents in the room. And it happens every four years that we have uh, a bigger amount of new presidents or new representation than in the other three years because of the Olympic cycle and some of the elections falling together with the cycle. So very enthusiastic to start another Olympic cycle with you. Um, and don't forget, uh, very enthusiastic to celebrate the 50th anniversary of our organization. And you'll see that celebration coming back tonight, that team uh, being there tomorrow. Uh, we have some, some good surprises for you uh, over the next couple of days, we hope, and uh, let's, let's have a, a, a good party tomorrow together uh, with hopefully some dancing and some live music uh, so we can really celebrate uh, the 50th uh, anniversary in a, in a proper way and thank uh, a couple of people that have played a significant role. So, don't want to take too much of, of your time because I know you have a bus to catch, probably want to relax a bit. Uh, but I do look forward to seeing everyone tonight on the boat. Hope we have a nice time there. And then I'll see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. As Brian said, registrations uh, open as of 9. I don't know whether we mentioned the dress code of tonight. Um, but just smart casual. Don't, don't overdress for the night. Uh, people asked me to point out a couple of examples of good dressing and bad dressing, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, so, uh, smart casual, uh, however you uh, interpret that, uh, that concept. So, we'll see you all uh, tonight, and uh, thank you very much.